what is absolutely and surely and without dispute an historic occasion. Um, no uh, Houston Oil has taken place under these circumstances. No Hist Auditor and Committee has ever had to conduct the affairs of a session with such restrictions. Uh, yet we are here uh, tonight uh, to hear the inaugural address uh, by uh, the auditor. So it's my very, very happy uh, duty and honor uh, to welcome all of our distinguished guests who you will hear in due course, and all of you who have uh, signed in uh, for this webinar, webinar the uh, opening meeting of the College Historical Society, the 251st session. So I start by uh, inviting the record secretary uh, to read the minutes of the last opening meeting. At the last inaugural meeting of the society was held on the 30th of October, 2019 with Professor David McConnell, McConnell uh, president in the chair. The auditor Luke Fanley delivered a paper entitled Leadership in Crisis. And the guest speakers were Ambassador Bobby McDonough, Senator Alice Mary Higgins, Professor Brian Fanning and Adrian Langan. And uh, while I was there, I have to admit, I don't remember a single thing about the evening. I think most people have found that this year has zipped past and yet at the same time seem to last forever. Um, and I'm sure most of the people have found that that's, that's pretty solidly scrambled their minds. Um, but I do think that this evening it's, it's quite poetic that the first ever inaugural address uh, that's being held online is on the subject of big tech. Uh, so if the stream cuts out, you can blame Breed for being too critical of Bill Gates. Um, now, in my opinion, a computer is a lot like a child because for the inexperienced, um, it's, it's, it's impossible to tell it what to do. Uh, your head will be wrecked. And you know if it does do what you tell it to do, it'll be a very different thing probably to what you actually intended. Um, now, that's not entirely fair because a child is slow. They're generally sloppy, but quite bright, whereas a, a computer is fast. It's accurate, but incredibly stupid. A computer will let you make more mistakes faster than any other invention in human history, with the possible exception of alcohol and maybe children um, as well. But I could just be a Luddite. Um, you know, when Microsoft, when Microsoft <laughs> says that Windows XP is the most reliable program ever, they might as well be telling me that asparagus is the most articulate vegetable. Um, but thank God for spell check, because I'd be a disaster without it. Can you imagine a world without spell check? You'd actually have to study when you were doing your spelling tests in primary school. And what do you do when you're writing a letter? Um, Dear Bruce, thank you for your very kind letter. I hope Alfred is feeling better when I come to visit to my... To... O... O R... When I come to visit next week. Sincerely, Anonymous Scribble could be a name, could be a doodle of some mountains. Um, I suppose what I am saying is thank God for emails. And most importantly, I'd like to thank the patron saint of emails, St. Francis of a CC. Thank you. So, uh, ladies and gentlemen, you've heard these uh, uh, minutes of the uh, last um, uh, opening meeting of the society. Um, uh, I, I do remember that uh, the list of speakers is correct, uh, the title of the address is correct, and therefore we know uh, that the essential uh, details, uh, records of that meeting are correct, in my opinion, and I assume that all of you who are attending will accept these, quote, minutes as a true and accurate record of the last opening meeting. I'll just comment that... Uh, my first opening meeting that I attended was in 1962. Unlike the record secretary who can't remember last year, I can remember what happened 58 years ago. I remember that the title of the uh, opening meeting was Christ, Class and Communism. I remember that the auditor was J. Michael Newcomb. I remember that the dullest speech of the evening was given by the uh, head of the British Communist Party and the best speech of the evening uh, it was given by the Reverend Dr. Professor A. A. Luce, who brought the house down and destroyed the communist spokesman, uh, destroyed him uh, totally. So memory has a funny way of playing with things, uh, Record Secretary. Uh, maybe you will remember things 
uh, when you're a little older. Uh, but as it is now, I can assure everybody that your records are true and accurate of the last meeting. It is now uh, my, my pleasure to award medals for oratory. And I wonder if in the first instance, we can bring up on the screen, screen Keeley and Hamill. Can we do that? I unfortunately don't think that's possible. Apologies. <laughs> All right. the well, technology. It, it is, I think, a great uh, moment for the society to uh, award a silver medal in oratory to Creveen Hamill, a former debates convener and former record secretary. should also say that I know from the papers today that he's through to the final of the Irish Times debate competition. Um, I, sorry, I forget the name of his partner, but in any case, the HIST has, as it should have, uh, a team in the final of the Irish Times debating competition which we've won more times than any other society, by the way. Just say that in passing. Uh, the Silver Medal for Oratory is also awarded to Gabriel Fulham, the former events convener. I wonder, is there a chance that we can uh, call her uh, to the screen? Um, I, unfortunately not. Uh, apologies. Very well. Well, in any case, uh, we give our congratulations to Creveen and Gabriel, uh, recipients of the Silver Medal for Oratory. Uh, well, now uh, we move to the main uh, business of the evening, uh, which is uh, the inaugural address to be given by the auditor, Brie Dolan. And I think uh, before uh, I ask her to do that, I should say that uh, I have enormous admiration for her and for the committee um, who have led the society uh, in this truly extraordinary year, which she will summarize in her introduction to her, uh, to her inaugural address. But I've had contact with her uh, quite often during the year. It's hard to imagine the circumstances under which she and the committee led the society. But there is no question about it, as you will hear from her, that the society is in very good fettle. And indeed, uh, the group of speakers we have for the inaugural meeting tonight, I think, shows how strong the society is, that five such people can give their time uh, uh, to respond to her paper. So it is with the greatest of pleasure that I invite the auditor of the 251st session, Bree O'Donnell, to give her address on the power of big tech. Auditor. Thank you so much, uh, Professor McConnell. <sighs> President, Vice Presidents, friends of the HIS, ladies and gentlemen of College Historical Society, Ladies and gentlemen, since Luke addressed you last, a lot has changed. Thankfully, it's my wonderful duty to report that despite the challenges, the society thrives. It's strange to think that a little more than a year ago, we were celebrating the 250th anniversary of this society in person. I dare say we were extremely lucky to celebrate the week to its fullest before the pandemic turned the world upside down. This year has been like no other for the HIST. In fact, my committee haven't even been able to meet up in person yet, and given the current restrictions, probably won't be able to before the end of the session. However, we haven't let that stop us. In this session, we've had online chamber debates every week with topics as varied as Irish republicanism, facial recognition, and feminist icons. We have organized panel discussions on journalism, racism in education, and political extremism. Despite the lack of wine receptions, we've still managed to uh, maintain social lives. And only last week did we host a Regency-themed Hiss Ball over Zoom with live music, games, and prizes. Competitive debating um, was one of the first to adjust to online activities, and the HIST has firmly established ourselves as the premier debating society in Ireland, with 83 speaker breaks, 44 judge breaks, and an astonishing 22 finals won. This session, we've hosted our very first online maidens competition, the very first trin uh, online Trinity IV, and the very first online Leinster Schools debating competition. 
All of this is to say that the society is doing well despite the circumstances. And it confirms that the College Historical Society is an organization that can adapt and overcome challenges, an environment where students can fail and make mistakes, a place for people to find their voice and use it, and a community that values respect, discourse, and good memes. Before I go any further, I'd like to issue some well-deserved words of thanks. First and foremost, to the committee of the 251st session. A leader is only as good as the people who surround them. I've been unbelievably blessed to be surrounded by such a hardworking, supportive, creative, and kind group of people who cares deeply about this society as I do. We will be nowhere without you guys. <laughs> I think you should all be incredibly proud of the work you have, you've done this year. To our generous sponsor, EY, thank you for our, your continued support of the society. It's been my absolute pleasure to work with you over the past two years. To the distinguished speakers this evening, Ms. Godsill, Ms. Lilliton, Dr. Bannister, Professor Clark, and Mr. Whelan, I must express my deep excitement and gratitude to have you speak at my inaugural. To Professor McConnell and all the honorary members who have offered their support over the year, we are so grateful for your wisdom and experience. This inaugural wouldn't be happening without your encouragement and guidance. To my family, especially my mom, who have been stuck at home with me for the last year and have had to listen to me talk nonstop about the hist, Thank you for your patience. It's almost over. <laughs> and finally, to the ordinary members of the HIST, thank you for coming and supporting the society. It's been a tough year for all of us, but it's proven that even without in-person activities, we are still a community at the center of student life in Trinity. And I'm deeply honored to be a part of it. And now I turn to the topic of my inaugural address. The power of big tech. This topic is surprisingly poignant for me. For most of my life, I've never had a passion, a cause, an area that instilled such drive in me that I desperately wanted to change the world. Not to say I wasn't ambitious, but I cared about many things. In the battle between breath versus depth, I've always chosen breath. Um, and that's part of the reason that debating appeals to me. Debating is, and always will be, an activity for people who like talking with authority and conviction about many topics without actually being an expert in any. Regardless, I didn't have much of a passion for any single topic until roughly two years ago. I was in the HIST committee room and we were discussing China's use of technology to control its population. The discussion steered towards the uh, comparisons between the West and China's use of surveillance. I believe it was Quivin Hamill, one of the medalists who was rewarded this evening, who first mentioned surveillance capitalism to me during that conversation. So please blame him for, for if this speech becomes just me ranting. <laughs> Since that conversation, I have been consumed. I've read The Age of Surveillance Capitalism by Shazana Zuloff, listened to every tech podcast I could find, wrote a paper on cyber ins uh, insurance, so studied cybersecurity, and even work as a um, digital marketer for a tech startup. I have experienced the power of big tech from both the user end and the business end. And let me tell you, both perspectives are terrifying. All of this knowledge and experience has led to the theme of this evening being the power of big tech. Three policy areas concern the power of big tech. Each of these areas have its own unique problems and solutions. They all intersect, but they are different and they impact companies differently. Many subtopics I mentioned will deserve, deserve speeches in their own right, but we don't have all evening. At the very least, we should understand the basics. The first is antitrust, or rather the economic and financial dimension. Antitrust indeed concerns big tech, the likes of Google, Facebook, uh, Apple, and Amazon. 
Google has no real search engine competitor. So the quality of its services has decreased. You get served ads when 10 years ago, you would have gotten valuable and relevant information. Apple gatekeeps the apps allowed on iOS and then charges a hefty fee for those on the app store. Facebook buys up its competitors like WhatsApp and Instagram. And, they, and when they can't acquire the company, they clone it, like the case of Snapchat and Instagram stories. <clears throat> Amazon uses its vast amounts of data to undercut the prices of smaller competitors who operate on Amazon's marketplace. Antitrust is arguably the most straightforward policy to understand. At least there is some precedent, not just with Microsoft during the 1990s, but also the railroad monopolies of the 1890s. Monopolies and antitrust practices have always been a feature of capitalism. The only difference now is the scale. These company stocks have been booming in a time of unprecedented economic hardship, hitting record values. Their, bill, their, their founders and CEOs are multi-billionaires, the richest in history. They are the oil barons of our age. The second area of interest is privacy. Data protection is now practically a buzzword thanks to GDPR. However, the effectiveness of these laws is still up in the air. So long as mile-long terms and conditions exist, so long as we consent at the push of a button, our privacy is an easily transferable commodity. Cybersecurity also has a significant influence on this area. Facebook only last week suffered a data leak of 500 million accounts. Hacks are the norm, and bad actors will continually invade your privacy and use it for financial and political gain. This is particularly dangerous on the geopolitical scale, with nations such as Russia and China spying and stealing intellectual property from the West. However, I think there is an, an alarming trend that often gets overlooked, but still has considerable societal impacts, and I hope to develop this point later in my address. Finally, you have content moderation. I believe this is the most political of the areas, especially after the Trump era. Its impact on democracy can easily be demonstrated by the increase in polarization and radicalization. Though an obvious example of content moderation failing spectacularly was the Russian interference in the 2016 US elections. Thanks to Section 230, better known as the 26 words that created the internet. Websites aren't utility providers nor publishers. To quote Hannah Montana, they get the best of both worlds and have little liability, but much control. Their moderation decisions have incredible, are incredibly political and impactful. Facebook has now even skirted its moderation responsibility in the form of its oversight board. And independent body to, to help Facebook answer some of the most challenging questions around content moderation. What to take down, what to leave up, and why. But this highlights the more significant issue. By creating this quasi-Supreme Court, Facebook participates in state building. They are literally creating their own judiciary with thousands of zero-hour contracted moderators as their police force. Facebook has 2 billion users worldwide, a population higher than any nation state. And in this quasi state, Mark Zuckerberg is king. The genuinely horrifying, the genuinely, the genuinely horrifying reality of this situation is not that Mark Zuckerberg um, is an unelected billionaire with no accountability to Facebook's users. No, it's instead that Mark Zuckerberg has no accountability even to Facebook's stockholders. Thanks to Facebook's dual class share structure, Mark has enormous amounts of voting power and many companies share similar structures with, uh, with founders and, and a small number of investors possessing outsized control over their activities. Therefore, we cannot expect corporate governments to rail in the power and influence of big tech. At this point, it probably seems like I'm scaremongering. Big tech companies have done a lot of good in the world. I don't deny that. 
I, 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 and I don't want them to disappear. I enjoy their services and admire their innovation. We wouldn't even be having this inaugural without big tech, but we should understand the dangers. There are the obvious dangers, the manipulation of democracies, the growing wealth inequalities, and the cybersecurity risks. However, I want to focus on one abstract consequence, the loss of your private self. I alluded to this consequence earlier in my speech, the consequence of a slow invasion of privacy. To best explain this, I will use the metaphor of the front and backstage. In this metaphor, you are a performer. <laughs> when you are on the front stage, you project your public self to the world. You are, um, you, you, you are aware that you are being observed and you act accordingly. When you are backstage, you are by yourself completely unobserved, unobserved. You can be your private self and be free and relaxed. There, there is nothing fundamentally wrong with your public self, but you cannot expect a performer to spend their entire lives on the front stage. They need the two aspects to survive. When big tech is constantly rendering parts of your life into data it can use for profit, you notice, even on a subconscious level, and you act accordingly. As this continues, there is less space and time for us to be backstage, to be our private selves. As someone who's grown up with social media, my, I, my mind feels like I'm constantly on the, front, uh, on the front stage. Social media and big tech are all encompassing. It touches every part of our lives. There are very few times when we are completely separated from it. There is a reason surveillance capitalism is called, is called that. It is always watching. Maybe I need a practical example of this to illustrate how big tech invades our private selves. Spotify rap. By the way, this example is courtesy of uh, Laura Crean, so shout out to her. Um, this is where Spotify tells you your top songs of the year with other silly statistics as minuscule as you listened to this song for uh, this many times on this particular day months ago. I particularly like this example because while music is a public good, often when you listen to it, it's in the comfort of your own, own home. It's a private action. What Spotify is doing is rendering that private action into data it owns. It analyzes and then commodifies it, both for advertisers, but also for the wider world. We as users are actively encouraged, practically manipulated to share our Spotify wraps online, to be our public selves explicitly. And this is now the norm. People are sharing more and more of themselves online and this will be continue because surveillance capital capitalism needs it so for growth on an individual level i understand you may not think this is a big deal this doesn't affect you and and that 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 makes sense but big tech is all about the power of scale on an aggregated level this has an impact it is causing cultural and societal change we we as a society accept that we should always be observed and that we should always be sharing our entire lives online. This intrusion has a mental impact as evident by the increasing mental health issues in younger generations. But I also think it has a philosophical and spiritual one. Think of Stroner's cat, stay with me here. When the cat is in the box unobserved, the cat is both dead and alive. It is only when uh, we observe it that its faith is sealed. I like to think our public and private selves operate in the same way. When we are backstage as our private selves, anything is possible, the future is uncertain, and that's wonderful. It's only when we become our <laughs> private selves that things become certain, which is also a good thing. Certainty is nice. but. But when forced to perform as our public selves constantly, we lose the uncertainty that makes life and the future exciting and meaningful. So as Alan Zuoff described this as a right to the future tense. Yes, this is an intangible concept, but isn't that what so many of our rights are? To finish this address, I want to draw comparisons between climate change and surveillance capitalism. 
on the surface, the two may seem drastically different, but both are crises that we will have to deal with in the 21st century. And the fundamentals of what makes each so difficult to address are actually the same. Climate change was caused by corporations claiming the commons, whether it was the air, oceans, or natural resources. Surveillance capitalism was created by corporations claiming our personal data. In both situations, corporations are pacifying us by selling convenience. It's easy and cheap to fly abroad for a holiday or to buy new clothes. It's free to connect with your friends over Facebook or to ask Google for information. It's not a surprise that we as consumers take this deal. It's excellent in the short term. But now we have long-term problems and we're gonna to need to deal with them. So can we fight these problems individually? Sure, but only partially. You can reduce, reuse, recycle, but that does, but, but corporations are still going to burn fossil fuels. You can delete all your social media or even become a hermit in the woods. But those corporations are still going to be trying to influence our elections and still risk data leaks. So I suggest that we fight these problems collectively. I don't act like I have all the solutions at this very moment. You need innovative, innovative novel ideas to overcome all these many issues and build a structure that can regulate big tech without removing the many benefits that big tech brings to the world. To implement these solutions, the government will have to take action and stand up to the lobbyists and special interests motivated by profit. There is a long road ahead of us. However, I think the first step is education. We need to identify the dangerous in incentives in the system. We need to understand the powers that these companies possess. And we need to label the very mechanisms that make surveillance capitalism. Start educating yourself and then inform the people around you. But most importantly, what you need to do is start imagining new rights, digital rights that were barely imaginable 50 years ago, but now have practical, necessary uses in this new age. New rights that we accept as inalienable. Thank you so very much for listening. Thank you very much, uh, Auditor, for a splendid and stimulating, and I would say disturbing address. Uh, I really don't think that many of us uh, who have heard you speak tonight uh, uh, will be able to offer the kinds of solutions that, of course, that we need. We look forward, especially, of course, to our five distinguished speakers who uh, have been given a great challenge um, to um, distill, uh, analyze what you have, uh, have you, what you have said, and hopefully lead us, uh, show us some other paths besides the ones that you have mentioned uh, to deal with this extraordinary problem: the power of big tech. Now, in the great tradition of the society. Um, as several of the speakers already know, because they were members of the society, we are going to uh, have proposed and seconded a number of traditional motions which have been proposed and seconded for probably much more than a century at this meeting. In the first instance, it's my enormous pleasure to invite Gillian Godsell uh, to propose the first of the motions. He's an award-winning journalist, broadcaster, author a former librarian of the society, shortlisted for Woman of the Year in IT, 218, longlisted for Creative Writing Awards, a candidate for the European Parliamentary Elections in 2014, receiving, Gillian, 11,500 votes, highlighting as you did the plight of those in debt after the economic crash. You write for the Irish Times, also for the Irish Independent, you're a frequent panelist on radio covering current affairs, health, women's issues, and politics. It's my enormous pleasure, honor to invite you uh, to propose uh, the motion that the thanks of the society are due to the auditor for her paper, Gillian Godson. 
Please switch on, Gillian. You're uh, you're mute at the moment. Pardon. So I'm saying you'll have to excuse me. Do I formally propose that motion now or speak to it? You, uh, at the close of your speech, if you would simply say, I propose the motion. Thank you, indeed. You know, some of us, have, our memories are very short, indeed. <laughs> <laughs> I'm blaming Sean. Uh, thank you, indeed. Thank you, Madam Auditor, ladies and gentlemen of the College Historical Society, and ladies and gentlemen. What an inspiring speech. I really have to say it was thought-provoking, interesting, wide-ranging, and very topical, obviously. And before I begin, just to address some of the comments that you made, Breed, and Madam Auditor, that I thought were really interesting, just two things, just jump up. I got this today. It's a letter. Somebody sent me a letter on a typewriter in the post today. Oh my goodness, how strange. And secondly, we're doing this, it's a, we're doing it on Zoom. It's a VoIP, a voice over IP service. And the inventor of VoIP is a man called Alex Mashinsky, who is now a very well-known serial US entrepreneur who is now the founder of Celsius, which is a cryptocurrency company. I interviewed him last week and I was saying to him, I said, it's amazing if you hadn't done this, we wouldn't have all survived COVID. So mad. Anyway, so anyway, go back to the, the motion, the power of big tech. Um, I congratulate you again, Madam Auditor. You laid out the scope in your presentation, some really interesting thoughts and ideas. And you talked with the antitrust. The Google serves up the bubbles of information in part based on your interest and in part based on theirs. Privacy of which more later. And thirdly, the content, the content moderation, who decides who gets to see what. And the first, the first and the third point are really valuable. Um, the first one, the bubble, you know, the filter that we live in, we know that. Nobody reads a brooch anymore. No one takes a paper. We read snippets and we watch cat videos. Um, and then who decides the content? That is a really, really interesting point. Now, the big example of deciding content came recently when Trump was deplatformed. Now, on a personal note, I was delighted. <laughs> I apologize for putting my politics front and center, but I was jolly relieved not to listen to him the whole time on Twitter. However, I'm not really happy that the person who made that decision, as you pointed out earlier, is a billionaire tech giant. I'm kind of going, I mean, I kind of agree with it, but I don't think it was theirs to make. And I, and I agree, it, it's, I'm not happy with that. I think a lot of people are not happy with it either. And the whole thing about who decides what we get to see, what, what we get to listen to. We know that if you Google something for flights someplace, you get back then um, loads more examples of cheap flights going to your different destinations. And even some of the social media apps in the background, if they're running in the background and they hear conversations, even what you're speaking, they can pick up on your stuff. And that's kind of scary. I remember a little while ago, when we first became aware of this, I, I have a radio program, Dublin City FM up in Dublin. And I was in there talking to Michael Glynn, who's a lovely, he's been there a long, long time. Many of you may know him. Um, and we were talking about this very issue. Um, and he went over to the printer, the humble, we're talking about, sorry, we're talking about this issue and also charity law that came up, whatever. He went over to the printer, the humble printer, and was horrified to discover a page had been printed on charity law rules. Now, I had actually printed it, but he didn't know that at the time. And he thought even printers were listening. So even though it's kind of like a bit, bit kind of funny, it is not that out of kilter. This is what's happening. But I want to go back to the middle point, privacy. And privacy, I think, is the most important issue that we face today. And it is the cornerstone of democracy. And frequently people say, oh, sure, if you have nothing to hide, you know, why should you be bothered about it? And in fact, recently in a WhatsApp group, somebody actually said that. The poor woman, everybody jumped on like a ton of bricks. But what that does, that, that concept of, oh, privacy, if you have nothing to hide, what, what's the problem? It divides the whole population to two distinct groups, either very good people or very bad people. Now, the bad actors, they're planning, you know, uprisings and they're going to bomb things and kill people and yeah they're hiding stuff and yes you know everybody would like to know that but does that mean the rest of us are very good and boring so boring and i mean you had a great example breed you said about front stage and backstage and that's true we have our front persona and we have our backstage and i mean like you were saying about you can you live like that all the time like the things that you tell your spouse or your girlfriend or your boyfriend quite different to the things you might tell the postman you know, the things you tell your doctor, again, different to things you might tell your insurance man. They're very, very different. And behavior, it's not just the mental issues. Studies have proven our behavior changes dramatically when we are being uh, watched, 
we become more compliant. Our decisions are different. Our decisions are influenced and not, as one imagines, uh, for the better. The same way in a prison, that central tower in the middle of a prison yard, it's watching the whole time. The prisons don't know if they're being directly watched or not, but it has an impact of them always thinking of it. Or even in a more simple form, you're driving along in the days when we were able to drive along and you spot a police car, a guard car in, in the, your mirror. I bet you all look at your speedometer and I don't even speed. I'll look at my speedometer and I'll think, did I indicate correctly? We think about all these things. So observation, being, being observed does influence our, our, um, our, our actions. And Zuckerberg, one of the main people who said, you know, who, who are, who, who's working in this space in the big tech, he famously said in 2010, he said, privacy is no longer a social norm. Privacy is no longer, he said that. Yeah. But what did he do in 2013? He and his wife bought a house but they also bought four adjoining houses. So no one could see into them. So obviously it was important to him, it's not to everybody else. And, and with tech, being big tech, it is interesting. And the point is you cannot fight big tech with activism, with protests on the street. That just doesn't work. Vandalism doesn't work. Big tech cannot be beaten by people with feet on, on, on the streets. And you mentioned also like China. And I spoke with a friend of mine today, a new friend actually, who's just returned from China. And she works in fintech and in fashion. And she admitted a couple of years ago, she, well, not admitted, but she said she agreed to allow her face for the facial recognition. She allowed her face be used. Um, so that means she didn't need a passport when she was buying stuff, so she just used her face. Didn't need, didn't need even a phone. Um, but more recently, she was out, well, this is, she's still there, so about two years ago, she was out and she inadvertently stole a scooter. Now, apparently, the scooter keys are all the same, so it, this happens, whatever. But anyway, she went home with the scooter. It wasn't her scooter. But the next day, the police arrived up at her door. They arrested her, took her off in the paddy wagon. Now, she was let off, but they found her because of her face. They followed her face, and they followed her to where she lived. And that kind of surveillance is scary because, okay, you might say it stopped someone inadvertently stealing a scooter that wasn't theirs, but in China, it, the way you act, it, you, you're rated. And then that, that sort of depends on where your kids can go to school, what careers you can have. So it is quite scary, or even like things like medical records. So again, I said earlier, what you tell your doctor, would you tell your postman? I doubt it. Um, and the whole idea of having your secure uh, medical records in Estonia, for example, they have a very advanced system. It's on the blockchain. I'll mention that once or twice. And you have all your, all your medical history there and you can share it. If you move doctors, you can share your entire history with your new doctor. But if you want to maybe get an insurance policy out, you only show them that which you wish to show. And also, if someone looks at your records, you're notified. If they're not meant to, um, they can be prosecuted if, if, it's, if they're not there. So, you know, uh, big tech can help. On well, the same way you mentioned hacks, hacks tend to be with centralized databases, LinkedIn, Facebook, all these billions of people who are on the same database. Tech can help. Blockchain, again, I mentioned a few times, it uh, provides a decentralized public ledgers and it can, they're unhackable or very hard to hack. Bitcoin not being hacked. So tech in general is agnostic. We know that. I work in, in blockchain. It's funny because people, when they talk about blockchain, they think about crypto and they go, oh, the dark web. Oh, it's very dodgy stuff. What are they doing there? And of course, most people realize that in this modern world, actually cash is and fiat is used much more. FinCEV, the uh, US government agency, they printed in October all the abuses with money laundering, trillions, trillions. And um, HBSC and JP Morgan among them were fined. More recently here, Ulster Bank. You know, there's a lot of stuff that happens um, in, in the regular world. But if tech is controlled, how do you, how do you, if you can't fight it with activism, what can you fight it with? And I would say you fight it with smarter tech. That's the key, smarter tech. So I'm an advocate for blockchain. Did I mention blockchain? I'm again boring here now. But some of the key tenets of this particular technology, and there's other ones coming through that are very helpful, but this one, one of the features of those are immutability. That means you cannot change it. You cannot alter the records if data is shared. Transparency, it's visible to everybody on a public blockchain. What you do is shared and it's decentralized, which means it's not subject, data subject to central censorship or hacking. So to fight big tech, not on the street, you want smarter tech. And another key attribute in this area is open source technology. For those who don't know, open source is technology that's shared. It's like the original Unix or the Linux community. Um, there's a thing called GitHub and everybody publishes their projects and their code. So it's all open for people can share it, they can fork it, they can do whatever they like with it. And it's human beings 
going forward, making better and better product. It's not Facebook buying them out or squishing them out. So going back to the whole idea of privacy, which is the one point that I've taken on, if society judges, if you judge society by how you look after it's vulnerable, that's a very important point. That is a very good way to judge society. But maybe even more importantly, you judge society on how it treats its dissidents. So if I may conclude before I make the motion, um, the tech is agnostic, people are not, people must control tech. And to quote Hal, he said, this mission is too important for me to allow you to jeopardize it. Thank you very much. So now, and having been reminded, David, thank you so much. I would like to propose the auditors uh, as motion today that, um, well, just to propose it, I think. Thank you very much, uh, Gillian Godsell, ex-librarian. You've uh, brought me some way towards thinking I might sleep tonight with some lovely ideas. Thank you very much. It's now uh, my pleasure uh, to invite Carlin Lillington, Dr. Carlin Lillington, uh, to second the motion that the thanks of the society are due to the auditor for her address. So let me say, uh, Dr. Lillington, uh, I have followed you in the Irish Times for such a long time with enormous pleasure. Uh, my wife, who happens to be sitting beside me, has done the same. You have enlightened us all for such a long time. Uh, the great Irish Times voice uh, uh, on technology. And your special interest, of course, in the political, social and business and cultural aspects of technology. You've written for many papers, The Guardian, The New Scientist, Word.com, Salon.com. Your work, uh, I understand, formed the basis for a judicial appeal that voided the European Union's data retention directive, a, a very substantial uh, public uh, service. I didn't know, and I'm not surprised that you hold a doctorate in Anglo-Irish literature from uh, our college. Uh, you've been a member of the board of uh, RTE, and you're, thank you very much, you've been a long-serving member of the advisory board of Dublin's, that is, Trinity's uh, Science Gallery. So, Dr. Lington, it's my great pleasure to invite you to second uh, the motion formally that the thanks of the Society are due to the order for her address. Dr. Lington. Thank you so much. And I'll, as well as, um, like, as Gillian did, do I make that second secondment at the very end? Is yes, that please. formal? Yes. yes okay. Please. okay, thanks so much. Um, thank you very much for the honor of speaking to the Society this evening. And I would like to thank the auditor for a very thought provoking and well considered talk that touched upon so many key issues in this fraught and highly topical area one which I agree and strongly believe poses one of our greatest challenges to us as individuals and as a society. I'd like to further expand on some of the auditor's important points about data gathering and data privacy, as well as touching on antitrust, explain why the current situation keeps growing ever more exasperating, and offer some possible points of future hope. In her groundbreaking book, Surveillance Capitalism, Shoshona Zuboff shows how Google became surveillance capitalism's chief architect. The company's early success with targeted ads structured around the, uh, what is now called our data exhaust, the initially undervalued personal data gleaned from our searches soon drove data gathering at a vast scale, which then brought the ability to define and target us at an ever more granular level. More free, and that's quote unquote Google services, have provided constantly refreshed data flows for Google from our emails, our social exchanges, our documents, our calendars, our journeys, our locations. And it didn't take long for other companies to look at Google and realize the value of owning people's data, which could so easily be obtained by offering these kinds of free services, supposedly free, or by simply building in data gathering as part of our normal operation of a device or using a service. So now the finest details of our lives are tracked incessantly online by our use of net enabled devices like our tablets, PCs and mobiles, exposing our purchases, our movements, our web browsing histories. But by the time we started to notice 
And it's important to recall here that these activities are so non-transparent that we could not and did not notice for many years. This lucrative surveillance system was firmly established and rapidly expanding. It was helped along politically by an era of anti-regulation neoliberalism embraced and argued for by Silicon Valley and the post 9-11 state support for surveillance embodied in the US by the Patriot Act, which facilitated much of the abuse that was detailed in the documents that were leaked by Edward Snowden. These indicate a significant degree of cooperation that's still generally denied between the data gathering big tech giants and the NSA, the US's national security agency. Now this may seem like a strange pairing, but there's actually a reason for this. The NSA and other state agencies like Britain's GCHQ or indeed our own policing services know that where they cannot tread due to data protections, the commercial sector under far less stringent legislation can. So surveillance agencies who would have to jump through very difficult hoops to get at such data um, can conveniently go to these uh, uh, commercial entities, the big tech companies, who have these comprehensive data collections that are all sitting there already that have been gathered in and stored. And so all that's needed then is some kind of arrangement to tap into it, hopefully on a legal basis for uh, in justified situations. But as we know from Snowden, that's not necessarily the case. So it hasn't really been in the interests of parts of government or industry to actually limit the practice of mass data gathering by big tech, as long as those practices went largely unnoticed. Meanwhile, though, commercial surveillance of all of us expands beyond big tech, what we think of as big tech, where we have sort of resignedly come to expect it, to the sectors where we don't. So our ability to avoid it or to move around the web or to use everyday devices like mobiles or TVs, vacuums or cars, household thermostats, or even sex toys, believe it or not, without being tracked and having data amassed, diminishes to the point of near impossibility. And yes, a few years ago, a sex toy was found to be sending user data back to its manufacturer. <laughs> The Internet of Things, of stuff with an IP address that can talk to the net and send data, keeps expanding. In many cases, as with Internet-connected cars or televisions, we cannot opt out any longer. You cannot buy a television now that doesn't connect online and which doesn't have an inbuilt microphone. And cars are all net-enabled now by default. With TVs, this is why what used to be an expensive piece of electronics is now relatively cheap. Manufacturers discovered that the data that they get from your, uh, in your cable and internet usage and even your voice commands. Can I, just one second, Carlin. Carlin, uh, I think Anthony's got some kind of, uh, he's got his mic on or whatever. Okay, off you go, Carlin. I think you've been unmuted. Apologies, that might have been me. <laughs> there, um, I'm, I'm there. I'm, that's okay. I, I'm, I'm used to sometimes running things where it's great having the power to mute everybody at a, at a fell swoop. But it's one of the great advantages of Zoom is shutting everybody else up. But I'll, I'll go back to my discussion of TVs here um, because I think this is a really interesting point um, that manufacturers discovered that the data that they get from your TV, your cable and internet usage, and your voice commands to the set are more valuable a product to them than the cash from selling you the actual TV. It's sort of a printer model, if you will, except the data, your, your data is the equivalent of the expensive ink that they sell somewhere else. Mm. It's also very hard to opt out. It's all very well to have a leave Facebook campaign, but many of the leavers considered Instagram or WhatsApp to be their non-Facebook refuge when, of course, they're both owned by Facebook. And at a more profound level, leaving any of these companies is well nigh impossible, as Gizmodo journalist Kashmir Hill documented in 2019. With the help of a technologist who set up a virtual private network for her, which would block any website or IP address associated with each, 
with each of the five biggest tech companies, she avoided each in turn for a week, then went through a final week during which all five were blocked. She found it a serious challenge, and I think importantly, a social and a functional sacrifice to avoid interacting with these companies because so many of the web services we use regularly are on cloud services from Microsoft or Google or Amazon and other sites and services that seem totally unrelated also are intrinsically connected because many businesses incorporate Google Maps on their web pages or have Facebook logins or they have like and share buttons or so other social media buttons. There's an element of collective social use too, which means not using a device, a platform, a service, means exclusion at a very fundamental level from family, friends, colleagues, services, something truly brought home to us over the past year during a global pandemic. In addition, the big platforms are vitally important communication channels for populations living in repressive countries where, for example, vulnerable human rights and social activists rely on sites like Facebook and YouTube for critical campaigns. That often heard perspective that this mess is essentially our fault because we don't really care. We already freely share everything anyway on social media has frustrated me for years. Most of the time, we just cannot see what is going on. Perhaps only the algorithm designing engineers and the most senior people in a company like Google or Facebook really understand the comprehensive power and the implications of the code formulas, the algorithms that operate invisibly in the background. We cannot fix this problem at its current scale by making personal choices about which services we use then because we lack viable options and we have too little information to inform the choices that we purportedly do have despite protections from a law as potentially powerful as GDPR. So then what can we do? I believe myself that strong, creative and purposeful business data and privacy regulation that continues to build on GDPR while also creating global equivalence is an important part of the answer. Right now through GDPR, EU regulators have been given significant powers around data protection, but so far fines are still of a size to be shrugged off by wealthy tech companies who undoubtedly see them as a relatively modest cost of gaining market share consolidating their monopolies and growing revenue. The European regulator for much of big tech is of course Ireland. And here we've been too timid and too slow. We've been waiting over half a decade now for findings from the majority of the regulators, many significant investigations into companies like Facebook and Google, which already have driven some of our EU neighbors to find ways to investigate complaints themselves rather than refer them to the Irish DPC. I believe the EU needs to seriously rethink the one-stop shop complaint function of GDPR and shift oversight for tech companies above a certain size to a pan-EU regulatory panel with the expertise, power, and resources to conclude significant investigations faster and decisively. We just don't have the luxury of long investigative times when companies, mar companies markets, and abuses gallop ahead with little meaningful restraint. And that should really be one of the lessons that we learned from the Microsoft antitrust trial two decades ago. By the time the decisions are made, often technologies moved on. On the other hand, the European move to buttress other aspects of GDPR is well underway. There's two new pieces of legislation that were introduced at the tail end of last year, the proposed Digital Securities Act and Digital Markets Act, which both hold much promise. Taken together, they would recognize big tech and the big platforms as gatekeepers with extraordinary power and reach. And at it, that specific recogni recognition of a company being of that size and that impactful means that those companies so designated would have significant additional responsibilities and um, there'd be increased public oversight as well. Meanwhile, in the US, which is home to most of big tech, 
Um, they're currently without a federal data protection and privacy law, leaving regulation to individual states. But the appetite has grown to address this gap. And in addition, in the past year, the US at state and federal level has uh, resurrected antitrust powers that have not been used since the US Department of Justice um, used them in the case against Microsoft two decades ago. But uh, curiously, this has happened just as the EU has eased off on a lot of earlier pro-antitrust rhetoric. But notably, the Digital Services and Markets Acts do bring antitrust back into the regulatory toolkit in potentially significant ways. However, I'd like to conclude by noting that the most effective step we could take and should take internationally is just to ban the entire business model of surveillance capitalism of global scale data gathering and the vast ad driven market for, uh, for data that's built up around it. All of the problems highlighted by, highlighted by the auditor are linked inextricably to this model. Society has demanded sweeping changes in how businesses, um, business has been conducted before. Notably, child labor has been banned. Uh, uh, the marriage bar was dropped, for example. Um, and the states have taken the, a move to def better define worker rights and consumer protections over the years, completely upending ways of doing business that once seemed the norm. We could just say, no more surveillance capitalism. And rest assured, the platforms could continue and big tech would find better ways to survive and profit, just not through mass surveillance and data analysis. But rethinking the business model is gonna require a significant shift in perspective, one that I hope will come in time because unlike antitrust laws or piecemeal privacy regulations, such changes would actually place control and ownership of personal data back in the hands of the individuals to whom that data belongs. Thank you very much for letting me respond to your paper. Um, auditor, and I'd like to second the motion that the thanks of the society are due to the auditor for her paper. My goodness, indeed. Thank you very much, Dr. Lillington. Uh, truly superb uh, reply, as indeed was uh, Gillian's uh, earlier, or discussion, I should say, of the auditor's paper. So, uh, ladies and gentlemen, you have heard uh, the motion that the thanks of the society are due to the auditor for her uh, address. You have heard this motion proposed, you have heard it seconded, and I can say with 58 years experience that this motion has always been passed. So I shall declare it passed in these extraordinary circumstances of a Zoom meeting. So the motion has been passed. Thank you indeed, auditor. The society congratulates you on your splendid address. So now um, we move to the second motion. And uh, it is my uh, great pleasure to invite Dr. Frank Bannister uh, to propose the motion that the uh, College Historical Society uh, is worthy of respect. So Dr. Bannister, of course, known to many of us, fellow emeritus of the college, a distinguished career as a civil servant, as a management consultant, and returning, as it were, to academic life. Um, and served as 10 years as the director of one of uh, Trinity's most demanding and successful courses, MSIS. Uh, your research has focused on e-government, e-democracy, online privacy. My goodness, how could you be in a better position to reply to the paper? You're a former chairman of the European Conference on e-government. Uh, you've been a former correspondence secretary and silver medalist for society and a former winner of the Irish Times debating competition. Also an editor, former editor of Trinity News. Now retired, you and your wife, I know that you share your time between Ireland and the USA. So I have enormous pleasure in asking you to propose the second motion. Dr. Bannister. Where is he? Somebody needs to unmute you. Um. Thank you. Uh, Mr. President, uh, Madam Auditor, ladies and gentlemen of the College Historical Society, ladies and gentlemen, my, my duty tonight is to propose that the College Historical Society is worthy of support, which of course I am delighted to do. 
but I cannot resist noting in passing that for the second time this century, the auditor is an EMSA student, which is quite a record for a course that comprises approximately one half of 1% of the undergraduate body of the university. But then as the auditor will know, EMSA students have always been in a class of their own. Um, I joined the previous two speakers in congratulating the auditor on an excellent address and in responding to her talk, I would like to do two things. First, just to put the phenomenon of surveillance capitalism in somewhat of a historical context. And, and secondly, uh, of the many, many dimensions of this issue and many of them being covered by the previous two speakers, I would like to comment on just three aspects of big tech. So this will be a talk as it were of two halves. So many of you that are watching this and listening to this inaugural tonight will probably have been still in your baby grows or may not yet have been born when a group of Islamic terrorists hijacked four commercial airliners and flew three of them into the Twin Towers of the World Trade Center and the Pentagon on the 11th of September 2001. Now to describe this as a shock to the American security establishment would be something of an understatement. Trillions of dollars expended over many decades on the largest and most powerful military in the world, not to mention billions spent on intelligence services, were unable to anticipate and prevent the most lethal external attack on the soil of the United States in the history of the Republic. 2,977 people died, most of them civilians, over 500 more than died in the Japanese attack in Pearl Harbor in 1941 in December. Faced with public service, the Americans did, government does what it often does, it overreacted in a number of ways. And one of these was to announce something called the Total Information Awareness Program, which is a proposal to basically track the suspicious behaviors of anybody in America, whether they were citizens or not. And just to give you an idea of how insane this was, one aspect of this was a proposal to monitor the books that everybody in the United States took out of their local libraries. Presumably they were looking for citizens checking out bomb making for beginners or maybe 78767 flight manuals, I don't know. Fortunately, Congress defunded this lunacy in, in 2003 and lunacy it was. But while it may have been a kind of securocrats fantasy, it was yet another manifestation in the long history of governments wanting to keep tabs on their own citizens, a, a history that goes back to biblical times. And state surveillance as a topic has been the subject of dozens of books and articles, and it's been mirrored in art. The most famous book probably on this is George Orwell's book, 1984, but there are many other famous examples you can think of, for example, A Scanner Darkly by Philip Dick, and uh, even a 1920 novel by the Russian author Evgeny Zamyatin uh, called We, which foresaw a, a surveillance society. And it's been in movies like Terry Gilliam's film Brazil, V for Vendetta, and even in the Batman movie, The Dark Knight, have dealt with this problem of a surveillance society. And of course, surveillance uh, provides the raw material for lots and lots of conspiracy theories, up to and including QAnon. Now, why am I giving you this background? Because what's remarkable is that in all of this concern in the last few decades about totalitarian governments, deep states, secret cabals, the Illuminati and Bill Gates, Almost nobody was paying attention to what was going on in private enterprise. And one of the few exceptions to this was the American novelist David Eggers, uh, who wrote a book in 2013 called The Circle, which is a kind of darkly dystopian stroke satirical preview of the world towards we seem to, which we seem to be heading at the time. And those of you who remember 1984 or any of it will remember Oceania, the nation in which Winston Smith lived, had three slogans, war is peace, freedom is slavery, and ignorance is strength. Well, Eggers the Circle, which is a company that's a very thinly disguised mix of Google and Facebook, has three alternative slogans, uh, much more attuned to the, to the uh, 21st century. Sharing is caring, privacy is theft, secrets are lies. Company motto is the vaguely sinister, all that happens must be known. And almost by stealth in a little more than a decade is a surveillance capitalism and big tech that have emerged as a parallel and in many countries, in fact, a more imminent threat to societies, polities and individuals than surveillance by the state. And now, as Carlin indeed pointed out just a minute ago, with the private sector gathering much of the data, the job of state surveillance has been made that much easier. So with that thought about background, I'd like to focus on three aspects of big tech, of the many, many 
that one could talk about. The first is economics. And if we want to look at big tech from the point of view of economics, we need to start with the fact that the big tech companies do not make up an homogenous group. Um, they're quite different in some ways. Three, for example, Facebook, Amazon, and Google, uh, maybe Alibaba are de facto monopolies. Twitter remains a monopoly for the time being, uh, at least until Donald Trump gets his alternative megaphone uh, up and running. But Apple and Netflix are not monopolies, really. Apple faces powerful competition in most of its market segments. Best way to think of Apple is kind of like a walled garden in which you're free to reside if you wish. But if you don't, there are other competitive choices out there. And Apple cannot hope to buy out competitors, say, like Microsoft or Samsung. Facebook can, and Facebook does. Now, any Economics 101 textbook will tell you there's a general rule monopolies are bad news, like cartels. They use their market power to extract rents or in layman's terms to rip the rest of us off. Uh, they suppress competition and they stifle innovation. And even monopolies that started out themselves by being successful through being innovative tend with time to be less so and often end up buying out otherwise uh, competitive emerging competitors that might threaten their own products. So they end up stifling the innovation that gave rise to their own strength. And by way of evidence uh, for this with this morning, many of you may have read that the US regulators have fined the Chinese giant Alibaba $2.8 billion uh, for abusing its market power. So my first point there for the three is that big tech monopolies need to be broken up. And secondly, we can look at this from a number of personal perspectives. And, and one such that tends to be lost a bit is to remember that cyberspace is forever. Um, the CN BC journalist Todd Hazelton recently asked Google to, for a complete file of the information that it stored about him and found that Google had recorded, and I'll read this list, his name, gender, and birth date, his personal cell phone number, his recent Google searches, the websites he had visited, that he had turned on his bedroom night last night, exactly where he'd been in the last several years, that he liked American football, jazz games, etc., where he worked, where he lived, the YouTube videos he had watched, his YouTube searches, and every time he had used his voice to interact with Google Assist, complete with recordings. Now, it's a long time since I was 20 years old, but I'm damn sure that I said some pretty stupid things back in the day that even I would find acutely embarrassing to have posted on the web in the morning. Yet this is the world which, unless something changes, most of you are going to spend your lives. A world in which your future employer or a future journalist or even a future mother-in-law may be able to find things in your distant past that you might prevent, preferred remained buried in your distant past. And bear in mind that we live in an age of cancel culture and mass shaming, which is a growing phenomenon, and a world in which you can be punished and harassed electronically and sometimes even physically for remarks that you may have made a long time ago. We need to allow for the fact that, as L.P. Hartley put it so elegantly, the past is a foreign country. They do things differently there. So my second point is that there needs to be a right to be forgotten. My third and final point is that big tech can be looked at from a variety of political perspectives, and we've heard some of them, but of all the evils foisted on us by social media, one of the most damaging, in my opinion, is that the algorithms it uses drive division and extremism in our society. Machine learning is a bit like Pavlov's dogs. It responds to feedback by repeating the behavior that led to it. So once you have a commercial system driven by commercial imperative that says more clicks the better, machines will seek more clicks and they will learn fairly quickly that humans respond and one way to ramp this up is to ramp up the level of emotion. So this just ends up feeding partisan politics and conspiracy theories but also social division and fragmentation. And if you'll bear with me, I'd like to read you a brief extract from an article by the author John Ronson, the, uh, who's written about conspiracy theories, writing in yesterday's Observer, and I quote, in 2020, the Wall Street Journal reported that Facebook executives had realized four years earlier that its algorithms were, quote, exploiting the human brain's attraction to divisiveness, unquote. Like the startling fact that 64% of users who joined extremist groups were enticed to do so by clicking on the groups you should join and discover buttons. Inside the company, there was alarm. What might these rabbit holes be doing to users' mental health and to society? Internal teams suggested numerous fixes, algorithmic tweaks to make the site more civil. But the executives nicknamed the proposals, quote, eat your veggies and ignored them. They argued that this was for reasons of fairness. There are more far right pages on Facebook, so any changes would have disproportionately 
affected conservatives. Facebook claimed in 2020 that it had changed in the years since these deliberations, end of quotation. Now you can choose to believe that last sentence if you want. But my third point is that social well, networking algorithms need to be thoroughly regulated. Now these three points, big tech monopolies need to be broken up, there needs to be a right to be forgotten, and social networks need to be regulated, are things that are all easily said, but they can only be done by governments. And in practice, given the size of big tech, this can only be by big governments in my view. And in today's world, that increasingly means the USA, European Union, and China. Now, China goes about this in its own way, and it's not a way that many of us, I think, would want to emulate. And if you doubt me, try asking Jack Ma. The EU is making some progress, good progress in many ways, albeit slowly. But most of these companies we're talking about are American, and it is in the US Department of Justice and maybe the US Congress that our ability to control these companies and the pathologies that they inflicted on all of us will live or die. And in that context, it's worth pointing out that the last time a US government broke up a tech monopoly, it was AT&T. And symbolically enough, that was in 1984. Mr. President, I'm pleased and delighted to propose that the College Society is indeed worthy of support. Thank you. My goodness. My goodness, thank you very much, Frank. I'm uh, beginning to feel that uh, this is a meeting uh, uh, when uh, perhaps we'll be pointing ways, maybe some quite important people, and I'm thinking of uh, Mr. Whelan and others, uh, that they will be listening to what's been said tonight and uh, taking notice. So thank you very much. It's now uh, my pleasure to invite Professor Blanard Clark uh, to uh, second the motion. And I should say, uh, it's a delight, of course, to have a member of the uh, faculty of the college um, uh, speaking tonight. You hold, uh, Professor Clark, the McCann Fitzgerald Chair in Corporate Law. Your research includes corporate governance, financial services law. You're the Deputy Chairman of the Irish Banking Culture Board and Irish representative on the OECD's Corporate Governance Committee. And my goodness, aren't we being pointed tonight towards the importance of governance. And you're also a member of ESMA's Takeover Bids Network and a Vice President of the Academic Board of the European Banking Institute. You've been a member of the Irish Central Bank Commission, the European Commission's for Informal Law Expert Group on Company Law, and the Reflection Group on the Future of EU Company Law, which surely is something uh, which must be fundamental to our deliberations tonight. So Professor Clark, it's a very great pleasure for me to invite you to second the motion that the College Historical Society is worthy of support. Professor Clark. Thank you, and thank you for that kind introduction. Um, so, uh, Madam uh, Auditor, uh, ladies and gentlemen of the HIST, uh, ladies and gentlemen, um, thank you. Um, I would like to concentrate on two aspects. It's, it's always a little worrying um, coming uh, second last because one wonders what's going to have been covered uh, already. Um, I was afraid that all that would remain for me to talk about was Spotify rap. Um, which I only discovered uh, about six months ago when my children told me what came up top of my list. And it is extraordinarily humiliating and probably the type of thing one shouldn't share with the postman. Um, but actually, Dolly Parton, just forget you've ever heard that. But yes, that, <laughs> that's, that's okay. Who it <laughs> that's who it was. Um, so I'm, I'm happy to, to concentrate on, on two aspects of what really was a, a fantastic and stimulating um, speech. So the first talks about how we describe these sort of big tech entities, and that leads to how we relate to them. And the second aspect I'd like to pick up is the idea, which is indeed a, a corporate governance issue, uh, the idea of um, shareholder democracy and the role of, of institutional investors in the markets and the disciplinary force they might have. So firstly, um, we you talked about them in terms of uh, utility providers and, and publishers, and that's true. Um, we can also think of them in terms of broadcasters. Um, so uh, Facebook was the second largest provider of news uh, in the US uh, in terms of um, attention share of the market. 
Um, we conceive them uh, as a gatekeeper, a private gatekeeper, um, and the manner in which they've done that has already been eloquently described um, by, by my colleagues. Um, Amazon, for example, has, has 2 million sellers and they completely control the market. Uh, who, who comes onto the platform, who sells, and on what basis they do that. Um, they're also regulators. And again, this was uh, an issue which uh, arose. And I think a lot of us were uneasy uh, with the uh, suspension uh, by Twitter uh, of, of Donald Trump. Part of us cheered because it was something that we had been waiting for so long to hear. Um, but I was particularly struck when I heard uh, Angela Merkel uh, speak out against it. Um, she said that it was uh, inappropriate um, to have uh, an entity like Twitter uh, to suspend uh, Donald Trump. Uh, she said it, it, this ban on free speech uh, was not appropriate uh, to be uh, something to be dealt with by big tech. Um, uh, and big tech governors. She said, this is something that should be regulated uh, in markets. Um, and she said, that's how we do it in Germany and that's appropriate uh, to do. So I think this is the very first time Angela Merkel and Donald Trump ever agreed and probably the last time on anything. Um, and it is interesting to see uh, the role in that respect of self-regulation. Um, Bridget, you mentioned the oversight board, which is still deliberating uh, on, uh, on whether this ban in terms of Facebook uh, is correct. Um, this uh, jurisprudential body as such, um, but without any case law, without any precedent and without an opportunity to build it up. Um, it's, it's been the subject of, of uh, a huge amount of criticism and I think quite a lot of it uh, well-deserved. Um, Trying to regulate this, uh, trying to introduce uh, some sort of self-regulation on this, I think is difficult. And the platforms themselves have discovered this. Um, so in addition to the oversight body, Go uh, Google has an AI ethics council. And we've discussed, and, and uh, again, um, Dr. Bannister will know much better than I will indeed we do it the same, um, the, 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 the problems to try and oversee and um, trustworthy AI and the governance uh, of that. So it's not just looking into that black box, but who will actually govern it. Um, Google set up uh, an AI ethics council last December um, and they uh, identified a number of people to be on this. It lasted a week before it was shut down. It was shut down because one of the people who had been invited to come on this, a lady by the name of Kay Coase, uh, turned out to be uh, an anti-LGBTQ advocate, um, somebody who was very closely associated with Trump. Uh, and the Google employees signed a petition saying, we don't want this. The whole thing um, fell apart. How do you ensure that balance uh, between different opinions um, and, and still listen to, uh, to individuals like this? Um, Facebook also did a civil rights audit, again, as part of self-regulation, um, and they failed miserably. Um, in fairness, they published the findings. Um, they, uh, looking at the position of Mark Zuckerberg, um, the view was that he had continually failed to show leadership levels and personal responsibility, uh, which would be expected from somebody sitting at the top of one of the world's leading companies. So absolute damning. And this is where... Um, I suppose one issue I'm interested in, bank regulation, and particularly after the crisis. Um, and one thing we've seen are very strict rules led by the EU um, in terms of fitness and probity. Um, so leaders in financial services, regulated entities are subject to these fitness and probity rules. So if a rule like that was introduced for an entity like this, it is very clear from that civil uh, rights audit uh, they wouldn't pass. Um, I also wanted to, uh, to mention, uh, Breed, I was thinking when I was, uh, heard you speak uh, about surveillance capitalism, and one book which I found to be absolutely excellent last year was uh, a book called Don't Be Evil by uh, Rana Forohar uh, from the FT, an absolutely fantastic uh, book. Uh, and so when you decide to take over the fill next year and you're doing your inaugural for the fill, I think that's what it should be based on. Um, but she... 
talked about the, the difficulty um, of leaders of these big <laughs> leaders of these big tech platforms uh, being above expectations and ethical standards and being a, above the law. So that brings me uh, to the second point, uh, and that's the um, shareholder democracy and where do shareholders come in? And Breed said um, quite correctly that one issue with, with Facebook uh, is that Mark Zuckerberg controls the voting rights in the company because of dual class shares. Not every share counts as an equal amount of votes um, and his um, shares count for more votes. Mm -hmm. So he controls 58% of the voting rights of the company. Um, and uh, Google will have the same type structure. And uh, what we've seen um, are arguments that this is absolutely essential um, because it protects the CEO's entrepreneurial vision, that this is absolutely key, that they have this protection, that it allows them to, um, to follow their dream and their view and their plans for the company and to invest in it and not to be subject to uh, any other entities. Um, and, and any other short-term uh, views. And this is a really topical issue at, at the moment, uh, whether this is true or not. Research suggests that's not true. Research suggests that dual class voting shares like this entrench management, um, allow them pursue their own interests, not necessarily uh, acting in the interests of the company at large, but also is associated with higher costs. The argument is that companies like Google and Facebook have succeeded not because of their uh, dual class voting structure, but despite their dual class voting structure. Um, and yet it prevails. And in one particular company, which listed a number of years ago in the States, a tech company, there were no voting rights other than the voting rights um, in this IPO that were held um, by the CEO. Um, are things likely to change? Possibly. And you might have been interested to, to follow the what's now perceived as a failed uh, IPO with Deliveroo last week. Um, we talk about our reliance on Zoom in the pandemic. I think Deliveroo probably comes a, a close second uh, for most of the people uh, listening to, to this, uh, ourselves included. So uh, one of the issues with them was hyped uh, as the most important uh, IPO uh, in the UK, marking a new advent, a new uh, freedom from uh, EU regulation, an encouragement um, by, uh, by Britain, sorry, by, by the UK uh, to invite uh, tech companies to list there and to make it a, a good environment to do so. Um, it, it was viewed as, as uh, 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 an absolute unmitigated disaster. Um, the share price uh, dropped uh, by 26% on the first day. And part of the reason for that was the dual class voting shares uh, of the owner, um, uh, Will Shu. He had, and this uh, percentage will sound familiar, 57% uh, of the company. The inst other institutional investors indicated they weren't happy with this. You had big firms like Legal in General not participating. So, does that suggest, in a way, Breed, that you're, you're getting your wish that we are seeing perhaps an end to dual cast uh, voting? Maybe. But, and here's the, the concern uh, that I would have, if that is the case, and if we are um, moving from companies controlled uh, by um, Jack Dorsey and Mark Zuckerberg uh, and, and individuals like this, and seeing them instead uh, led by shareholders, by institutional shareholders, by large shareholders, by hedge funds. Will we sleep any better at night? Um, will we uh, be concerned as to whether those institutions are likely to adopt a short-termist approach? And we've seen in this country um, the, the damaging effect that short-termism in our banks um, wrecked havoc uh, on our economy in the run-up to, uh, to the crisis and afterwards. So I think there's, there's a definite concern there. What's the EU doing about it? Well, the EU has introduced uh, a proposal um, at the moment, it's draft stage, uh, for sustainable corporate governance, where directors are asked 
um, to look after not short term shareholders, but to look after the broad success of the company, including all shareholders uh, and all stakeholders. And that would include issues, and this brings me back to the point you raised earlier as well, Breed, things like climate change and uh, environmental social governance factors will be part of it. But the EU are not willing to trust shareholders to do this. And so they are giving this authority to directors, which brings us back to who are the managers and the directors of these companies. And then you're back in the same position you were in at the start. So I think it's a difficult issue. My own view is that it is, uh, it is going to take um, uh, EU uh, uh, coordinated um, rules. So I think uh, I would absolutely agree uh, uh, that it is essential to get US, EU uh, and China um, uh, on board. I too am really optimistic uh, about the new digital services and markets package um, coming from the EU. I think that offers opportunities uh, to oversee um, uh, technology companies. Um, I like the fact that it is based on both supranational and national level regulators. I think that makes sense. I think there's an element of flexibility and core principles involved, which will be necessary uh, and which will uh, hopefully work. I think we have seen aspects of it before in terms of large platforms. Again, that's similar to the way we regulate banks at the moment in terms of significant institutions. Um, I think what's missing is a, is a public interest requirement. Um, I think that's needed. Um, so uh, I will leave it at that slightly uh, more uh, optimistic, perhaps, than the previous speaker, uh, but still uh, a path to, to travel. So thank you very much uh, again, Madam Auditor, for your speech. Uh, and I'm delighted uh, to second uh, the proposition. Thank you very much indeed, uh, uh, Professor Clark, for many insights there, for, especially from the perspective of law of crucial importance, of course, in the whole matter. Um, now, um, unusually, uh, at inaugurals, I don't remember an occasion, but it's a very pleasant uh, matter to say, or to refer to, and that is that we have a fifth speaker of the evening. And that is uh, Anthony Whelan, ex-auditor of the Society and a most distinguished uh, uh, person. He had a wonderful year uh, as auditor of the Society. Um, in fact, I could hold up here uh, for those of you who may not have seen this truly splendid history of the society by Professor Patrick Gagan. And uh, when you look up in the index, Anthony Whelan, you find a number of pages concerning his uh, year as an auditor. And uh, there's a remarkable difference between his one event of his year and one event of Reed O'Donnell's year as auditor. Because at a certain stage, the college instructed the HIST to de-platform a speaker. And that actually had really had to happen. And uh, the HIST had to do this and to take away an invitation from uh, the South African Minister of Plenipotentiary at the embassy in London. But the matter uh, was dealt with quite brilliantly by the auditor. And he wrote a memorable letter to the Irish Times, which uh, should be referred to much often these days, particularly when uh, deplatforming is uh, an issue. But the point being that, that I want to make, that when a question arose earlier on in the session of whether or not uh, Richard Dawkins should speak to the society, the provost of the college went on record and said, the college will not instruct the College Historical Society who to invite or who not to invite, and that the college holds a very special uh, uh, commitment to the idea that student societies are run by students. And uh, whatever about um, the invitation to uh, Richard Dawkins, what I was delighted uh, to know and to uh, recognize that the provost said it was not his business. And by the way, it was something that he said at his fine speech at the gala dinner of his 250, 
when he proposed the toast to the hist. So, uh, Mr. Whelan, you had a special, uh, you have a special place in the history of the society, as Patrick Kagan tells us. Uh, you currently are in a hot seat. You are the digital policy advisor for the European Commission President, uh, von der Leyen. Couldn't be more significant to our discussions this evening. You've previously been the Director for Electronic Communications, Networks and Services at the European Commission, in fact, since 2013. You lectured and researched in public law at Trinity, and when you decided to leave, I can remember thinking, that's a great loss to us. But you've gone on, of course, to more than uh, justify what uh, that decision of yours. You're a barrister. You've worked as a lawyer at the European Court of Justice in the legal service of the European Commission. And for five years, between 08 and 13, you were the head of the cabinet of the EU Commissioner, Neely Cruss, in the competition and digital agenda portfolios. You really are in, uh, you had such remarkable experience. It's wonderful that you found time uh, to reply to the auditor's address. And we all look forward very much to you. Can I put it this way? Speaking to the motion uh, that the thank that the uh, College Historical Society is worthy of support. Mr. Wheeler. Thank you very much, David, Mr. President, uh, Madam Auditor, ladies and gentlemen of the College Historical Society. Ladies and gentlemen, that's a formula I haven't uh, produced in probably 25 years, and it's a great pleasure to hear it again from, from my own mouth. Uh, it's also really a, a great pleasure to have been able to participate in, in this debate, to hear the auditor's uh, address, which I think has very ably touched on a, a number of issues which, which fill my day in the, uh, in the practical politics of, of regulation of digital and, and management of digital investment at, at the European level. And, and something I would really like to congratulate the auditor for, which also comes through very much from the uh, remarks of the other speakers, uh, is the way in which she has mixed uh, a broader question of vision of our digital future, of our digital uh, present, of our digital lives, with practical considerations. Uh, because that, in a way, is how good digital politics and probably good politics generally is done. You, you have to take problems and, and break them down into solvable bits, politically feasible bits, uh, but you must not lose the vision. Um, and for that reason, uh, I would like to recall uh, the um, uh, uh, the um, uh, the, the vision which President von der Leyen set out at the beginning of her mandate. Um, she characterized her two priorities as the green and digital transitions. And in digital, she underlined the European interest in digital sovereignty. Now, sovereignty is, a, is an expression that can be uh, deployed poorly uh, or misunderstood. But what she has clearly meant and underlined since the beginning of her mandate is that uh, in an area so important to our lives, not just to our economic lives, uh, but also to our society, to the preservation of our values, of our way of life, uh, we need to have the capacities to steer at least to some extent uh, how, how this evolves. Those are economic capacities, they are regulatory capacities. Uh, in part, it is the capacity to, to find like-minded uh, partners on the world stage. Uh, and one of the things we have been happy to do uh, in the last uh, months is, is precisely to, to hopefully build uh, new common ground with the United States on a number of issues, uh, as well as other partners, of course, yeah, including many of those which, which uh, we're talking about this evening, and uh, which are getting uh, a renewed attention on, on the other side of the Atlantic. 
Now, if we look at the, the three specific points that the auditor raised, uh, antitrust, privacy, content moderation, which, for example, Frank uh, came back to with three very, uh, very trenchant uh, proposals uh, of, of proposals, uh, of solutions, break up the monopolies, ensure there is a right to be forgotten, um, uh, regulate uh, the algorithms. Uh, we don't always perhaps manage in, in political life, in, especially in, in the very complex environment of, of, of the European Union, where we have multi-country as well as multi-party and, and multi-stakeholder interests to take into account. Uh, we don't always manage to, to get it into single line solutions, however, however persuasive they may be. But in fact, we, we have a number of proposals uh, at, uh, at the table, which I, I think can go a long way towards addressing some of these issues. Uh, now, at, at the risk of winning uh, the David McConnell Prize for the dullest speech of the inaugural of 2021, uh, let me just mention a few features of those. First on antitrust, or let us say on the economic power of the, the most concentrated uh, platforms. As has been mentioned, we have brought forward a legislative proposal called the Digital Markets Act, which would significantly simplify antitrust type action or action against practices which are normally addressed through antitrust law uh, by simplifying the identification of what are the gatekeepers and laying out a clear set of rules which these gatekeepers must respect in their economic relations with their users, with their business users and with their, with their competitors. Uh, outlawing the tying of different core services together, uh, outlawing self-preferencing whereby the platform's own activities are, are favored relative to those of its perhaps own customers, um, outlawing the use of customers' own data in competition with them uh, and, and a number of others drawing from our experience. Like any set of legislative solutions it is by design blunter than the sophisticated work of antitrust law, which engages in individualized assessments with efficiency analyses and, and lots more uh, besides that keeps economic advisors uh, very gainfully employed in, in our procedures. But the, the bluntness is tailored in the design of the proposal uh, to practices that we think can rarely, if ever, be, uh, be uh, justified by a powerful economic uh, gatekeeper. Uh, and of course, the number of players that would be constrained by these rules uh, is, is relatively limited. Let me then talk a bit uh, about content moderation, or let us say, more generally, the social significance of platforms, the, the way in which uh, social media, but uh, of various forms, uh, can uh, and have assumed a massive significance in our social and political as well as, as private lives. Now, th this is an area where there are no simple solutions. Uh, we all, I think, including President von der Leyen, shared the discomfort with uh, the uh, uh, apparently purely privatized decision on uh, the exclusion of President Trump uh, from uh, a number of major platforms in quick succession, uh, leaving aside the specific question whether he had engaged in some illegal utterances such as incitement to violence, which uh, of course need to be addressed uh, specifically, the, 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 the full exclusion of a, of a major political figure is, is not uh, light in its consequences. At the same time, uh, a situation where uh, content moderation decisions on non-illegal uh, content, on disinformation, for example, uh, or on, uh, let us say, objectionable but 
in different countries, perhaps not illegal types of speech. Uh, the, the idea that the, the power of control of this would pass completely to, to public actors, to regulators, and ultimately to political decision is not very comfortable either. And as long as uh, moderated social media exist, we do not see a better solution than one that is in a way co-regulatory, where we impose greater responsibility on the platforms for in particular, the very large ones for the uh, social consequences of what they do, the consequences of moderation decisions for free expression, for example, which uh, as David recalled is a, a value I'm personally quite attached to for some time. Um, uh, uh, even hateful free expression, which I think that example was also good for. Uh, the uh, the uh, platforms should engage, be obliged to engage in a risk assessment of the systems that they have in place. Those systems should be subject to audit. The audit should be able to generate recommendations which are acted upon. Um, there uh, should be clear transparency about what the criteria driving the algorithms uh, are. You should be able to know why certain content is being recommended to you, for example. What are the criteria that lead to you being uh, offered an endless stream of, of Dolly Parton hits um, or whatever it may be. Um, uh, this this can really be the only way of finding a, a, a sort of solution uh, as to who polices the, the police. But we, we need to, as it were, have a, a, a constant dance between the platforms, uh, their auditors and, and, and regulators. Uh, and in this area, just as a little uh, aside, we are experimenting with a two-level governance where we would still have national regulators as the primary players, uh, as in GDPR, but where there is a possibility for the Commission to intervene at the invitation either of the perhaps overburdened national regulator or at the invitation of a number of, of other national regulators. Um, let me touch briefly on something that's uh, less uh, publicly known, but which I think is important to our overall assessment of a, of a world where data is important for everything. We are, of course, very sensitive, at least since GDPR, but there was, in fact, a data protection directive before that was 20 years old, uh, to the, the possible abuses of data. Uh, we also need, I think, to be conscious of the opportunities of data, uh, opportunities provided that the, the use is well framed. Now with personal data, GDPR already goes far, but of course people are conscious of the problem of information overload, uh, of the difficulty of, of declining all of the services for which we essentially pay with data. But there may be some solutions. One of them which we propose in uh, the uh, what we call the Data Governance Act, is uh, provisions on data intermediaries who would be freed of conflict of interest. So a bit like a fiduciary holder of data, which gives the user or the, the data provider much greater influence over what their data is actually used for in practical terms, including for what we uh, have called data altruism, namely free decisions by people to make their personal data available, for example, for medical research or, or other uh, public interest purposes. Uh, something we still have coming in the pipeline, uh, all going well in the next week or so, is a legislative proposal on artificial intelligence. Now, much of what is going on in content moderation uh, and much else uh, in big tech is or soon will be uh, driven by what we can generically call artificial intelligence. Again, something 
for which there are many, many positive uses uh, available, uh, which should not be discouraged or, or suppressed. But we do think that encouraging a responsible use of artificial intelligence requires the goalposts or, or the parameters to be set relatively early, in particular for what we call high risk uses. Uh, if AI is being used to pick my CV, uh, which David very kindly gilded, uh, mm -hmm. Uh, among many others for, for a job, then uh, the possibilities of risk of bias uh, in terms of age, sex, or um, many other uh, uh, features uh, is there. Uh, and we should have a certain number of rules in, in place for that. Equally, if AI is driving a car with fairly significant and obvious uh, safety implications for, for me and for, for those on the road around me. Um, perhaps most obviously, if AI is driving uh, the analysis of images on CCTV cameras all over our streets in real time, uh, then uh, at a minimum, you need to be happy about the data that has been used to, to analyze about how the use has been logged, about explainability and transparency, uh, about adherence to standards. Uh, and this is the sort of area where, unlike perhaps some of the existing data use cases that we know in, in the platforms, uh, there is an opportunity to get in early and to, to shape this very important technological development in, in ways that we think are, are consistent with our values and where we can hopefully lead uh, also uh, globally uh, in this respect. Now, I have taken you down a number of different legislative wormholes, um, but let, let me finally zoom back out again, uh, because as I said, the, these are the salami sliced products of, 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 a, of a legislative machine, which is the, the means by which we seek to, to gain a, a, a level of control at, at European level of some of these most uh, important uh, challenges of, of modern digital life. But these will not on their own accept, uh, address fully the, the sort of transversal issues uh, that the auditor has also raised. Um, the, the problem of the constantly monitored self, uh, of the being constantly front stage, uh, is something which will remain a constant challenge. We will not be able to declare a mission accomplished at a certain moment. Uh, a little bit the other side of that coin, there's a lot of attention to what is called attentional competition, but uh, uh, people are being constantly pestered for their eyeballs uh, in a way which is, generates constant distraction, something which you may not perhaps be well able to articulate as a, as a concrete political problem, but when you become conscious of how it affects your whole life and society, you think, well, this is something on which we need to continue uh, reflecting. So, uh, Without blowing the, the EU trumpet uh, too much, I, I do agree that the European level is one where we can bring a number of important practical solutions. They must be solutions that can be implemented and embedded in the still often quite diverse uh, political and social realities of our member states. But I think it is at that level that we can look eye to eye both with some of the other major world regulators and with big tech itself. Uh, and uh, in that famous uh, Ronald Reagan phrase, uh, slightly adapted, I'm here from Brussels and I'm here to help. That may not be the most dangerous nine words in the English language, or so I hope. Uh, and now in a, for me, delightful non sequitur. I would like to express my support for the motion that the College Historical Society is worthy of support. Thank you.
Thank you very, very much indeed, uh, Anthony Whelan, for, as it were, giving us an insight uh, to one of the most powerful offices, let's say, uh, let's be aware of this, on the planet, that is, of the President of the European Union, the largest economy, I think, on the planet, uh, and with a significance in this matter, which is of just, just supreme importance, and that uh, you, uh, from the HIST, are there, and uh, casting your, your mind over these um, extraordinarily challenging uh, problems. Thank you very, very much indeed. So now, uh, it is my uh, function to uh, ask, uh, to put this motion to the House, which has not only been proposed and seconded, but supported uh, for the first time, that is probably in the history of the society, uh, that the College Historical Society is worthy of support. And once again, I take the liberty of uh, making the assumption that this will be supported unanimously, and therefore I declared it passed. Uh, uh, so uh, thank you to all of you who are not objecting to this uh, way of passing the motion. Um, it says on the order paper that um, I give some closing remarks. Um, I'm not going to say very much because there is something quite uh, different which is going to take place after the formal meeting is closed, and that is there will be an opportunity for a question and answer session uh, conducted via Zoom. And I do not want to take time away from uh, the questions which I'm sure will be coming for our five distinguished speakers and indeed for our auditor. But I, what I do want to do is to say just a, two or three things. First of all, to congratulate the auditor on a truly splendid choice of subject, brilliantly uh, composed, uh, splendidly presented uh, with aplomb and dignity and incision, uh, and for having collected five wonderful people to uh, respond to your address. You have raised some of the most uh, challenging questions which face us all today. And um, those of us who perhaps were not as aware of these things before, uh, certainly have been alerted in ways that I think we will be entirely grateful to you for. Um, age is a kind of buffer against this sort of thing. You see, um, I seem to just get enormous uh, rewards from dealing with big tech. Apart from anything else, it's made tonight possible. Um, and I am not aware Dr. Lillington, of any of the terrible things that you uh, have outlined to me. I was not aware uh, that my sex toys were going to be, um, uh, <laughs> <laughs> that they were going to be, uh, their, uh, their activities were going to be recorded. Um, uh, I didn't know uh, that one of my favorite singers, Dolly Parton, was going to be held up to ridicule by uh, some people. Uh, what a wonderful lady she is with such great programs, for example, on promoting reading, distributing books. Not something one would have recognized years ago that she had that, that quality in her. So look, Dr. Lillian, you scared the pants off me. And um, dare I say it, um, probably if I take my pants off, that will be no. Uh, this is getting worse. So I'll have to, I will have to, I'll have to slow down. But there's something, my wife, by the way, is now leading. You see, if you are of our age, we are simply not intruded upon. Uh, I think the auditor said it absolutely wonderfully, that you can be front stage or backstage. Well, I have a backstage and I've had a backstage all my life and I don't find that any of these things intrudes upon it. But probably that's because I don't take part in social media at all. I mean, almost zero. We have some small Facebook connections with our family, which are, we think, we think, entirely private. Uh, we live a wonderful uh, electronic life. Uh, Google is a marvel, absolute marvel. Um, I, my life was totally revolutionized when I bought my first Apple, advised by David Abramson. I said to him, do I buy an Apple or do I buy a, a uh, 
whatever those other computers are. And he said, David Apple is years ahead. And that was 1984, as Janet reminds me. Changed my life. That day I brought my Apple home and I typed and sent my first letter. I had never typed a letter in my life. My world has been transformed. And it's very, very, very hard to, for me to point to anything that I think has threatened me. Now, that does not mean that I have not been alerted in the past, quite frequently, by the way, by Dr. Bannister in discussions about the extraordinary dangers uh, of the present electronic surveillance system. And so we have to take this incredibly seriously. We must be guided by people like our speakers tonight. And those of us who are innocent of all these interferences and sail on in our electronic world, un, quite untouched by any of these worries, most of the time, we really have to pay attention to you, and be guided by you. And I do read Dr. Lillington diligently. And in spite of my insouciance, if you like, and my lack of worries about these things, this is not the first time I have been worried, of course. So look, it's been an extraordinary evening, a totally extraordinary evening. I'll just mention one last thing in closing. Uh, in one of my incarnations, I was the chairman of the Irish Times Trust. And I was chairman at a time when it faced bankruptcy. And that was due to the dot-com collapse. So almost none of you will under know this, but at the time, the Irish Times had a huge advertising income, most of it from the IT industry in Ireland absolutely massive income. And we did not ever think that this was going to end. And of course it did, the dot-com collapsed because those advert advertisements ceased to come in and the Irish Times faced more or less immediate bankruptcy. And I was a new member of the trust and suddenly found myself as chairman of the trust, faced not only with the bankruptcy of the company, but with the uh, replacement of the chief executive and the replacement of the editor and with um, the prospect of asking our staff uh, to take voluntary redundancy, one third of them did. So the Irish Times nearly collapsed. We, we recovered, as you know, but it was a new world that we were moving into and we knew about it beforehand and we were trying to face up to it. And that was that the world was being, our world was being replaced by the digital world. They were doing two things. First of all, taking our adversaries, not just the ones I talked about, but all kinds of adversaries. And secondly, they were pirates. They simply took our scripts. They took the material from our papers and they put it in one way or another on their sites. And they didn't pay for it, they didn't pay a penny for it. And that uh, is a challenge which remains to this day, but the advertising base of the traditional media has been greatly reduced. And secondly, that uh, the uh, great companies that we've been talking about, several of them in any case, have simply taken what we pay for, we that is the traditional media pay for. Uh, and that problem has not been resolved. The Australians are addressing it. But I hope, uh, uh, Mr. Whelan, that Anthony, that perhaps in the European Union, there will be some efforts made to uh, redress that balance because it's crucial. Uh, we really do rely heavily on the traditional media, the high quality media, not the gutter press, not the red tops, but the main, main uh, papers and indeed the stations, for example, public radio in the States, uh, such an important, they made that so important, but how are they getting by? Extraordinarily difficult. So that's a, a challenge. And I do hope, it wasn't mentioned tonight, but I hope uh, that will be taken on board uh, by our speakers in their very substantial responsibilities in this regard. So with those few comments, congratulations to the auditor for one, I think of one of the most provocative and most uh, important uh, inaugurals that I can remember in all these uh, years. So thank you, uh, 
and Breed O'Donnell for a splendid address. Thank you to the Society for hosting it. And uh, it's uh, a sad duty in a way to close the formal part of this meeting, but I now hand over to the auditor who will uh, lead us into the question and answer uh, session. And thank you so much to five splendid speakers. Uh, good night from me in my formal role as president of the society. And thank you. Thank you so much, McConnell. Um, that was a wonderful closing address and it means the world to me that um, all the praise and support you've given me over the last year. Um, and thank you again to all the amazing speakers. Um, what we, what we'll, uh, before I adjourn, I just really quickly wanna say that when I was younger, I suffered from a speech problem and to be here today, giving an address as auditor of what was once described as the finest of all the schools of orators. Um, it just means the world to me. So thank you to everyone who's given me this opportunity. And um, well, um, and I'll officially adjourn the meeting now. And what we'll have now is a Q&A section. So for the audience members, if you'd like to ask a question of any of the speakers this evening, uh, Pacific or just a general question about the power of big tech, um, please use the Q&A function. Um, and um, uh, we'll be uh, keeping an eye on that. But uh, I do have... Sorry, I, I, I do have um, a question to, um, I believe it was um, Dr. Uh, Bannister who talked about breaking up uh, big tech. Um, and obviously that's a, a, a spectacular idea and a very catchy phrase, but I was wondering what, like by ways of how do you do that? And um, what sections of each business would you break up and um, how would you ensure that's effective? Well, I don't think it's actually that difficult in this, and it's certainly no more difficult than breaking up AT&T was. I mean, AT&T was an integrated telephone network for the entire United States. Breaking that up was quite a big move. Um, but if you actually look at big tech, there's quite a lot of natural lines of cleavage. For example, why does Google have to own YouTube? Why does Facebook have to own WhatsApp or Spotify or anything else? So I think one thing you could certainly do is you could break off and you could also stop large companies buying up competitors. In other words, you could put in place legislation that essentially regards buying out threatening emerging companies as an anti-competitive practice. That's what, that, th those are two things you could do. Breaking up a company the size of Facebook into subcomponents, mini Facebooks, is going to be difficult. Uh, and I don't pretend I'm not a lawyer. I don't pretend to know exactly what the complications of that might be. But there are certainly things that could easily be done. Google is eminently breakable up into all sorts. I mean, look at all the facilities that Google has. Why not, for example, break Amazon Web Services away from Amazon Retail? Why not break Google Translate into a separate company with a separate shareholding? So there's all sorts of possible ways if, if one is imaginative enough. Um, but as I said, I, as, as, as uh, I think, uh, I think uh, Auntie Whelan said, it's quite easy to give a, a six word slogan. Um, it's a different matter uh, to actually do this in practice once you get down into the legal nitty gritty, but it has been done before. It was done by Teddy Roosevelt back in the early part of the last century when he broke up the oil companies. It was done with AT&T. It was almost done with Microsoft, but in the end it turned out to be not to be necessary. And it was talked about with IBM at one stage, although IBM was eventually overtaken by other forces in the market. So I think this can be done. It requires political will. And the problem, if I may just say, one of the difficulties, particularly in the United States, is that these companies have become so powerful and so politically powerful that they have something of a stranglehold on legislators. And, and legislators are afraid to move against them. And this is where you get into really dangerous situations like, uh, and I was, you know, I, I, Donald Trump's Twitter annoyed the hell out of me, but I'm with Angela Merkel. I don't think Jack Dorsey should have cut him off. And I think we're into dangerous territory when private enterprise is starting making decisions about democratic discourse. Um, so yeah, I think these things can be broken up, but it does require the political will. Any other uh, respondent like to make a comment on that, on breaking up big tech or? Yeah, Caroline. Um, just, just to add to that, um, 
one observation, which is that Facebook has been making this announcement. Mark Zuckerberg came out um, saying how pro privacy he was. That, you know that the company would would was devoting itself to increasing user privacy, and one of the steps it would be taking would be to at a at a platform level create links between WhatsApp, Facebook, and Instagram. And this was supposedly in order to, I mean, from his the way he presented it was this is a plus for all of us because it gives us greater security and in and uh, connectivity way down um, sort of under the hood of all of these interconnected platforms, which the company now is. Um, but the the minute that was announced, it was obvious to, I think to any of us old enough to have watched the Microsoft antitrust defense, that what Microsoft tried to wiggle out of the DOJ prosecution um, 20 years ago by arguing that its browser was so intrinsically bound to the operating system that it would be, um, that it would break the operating system and, get, and give users a, a um, truncated um, experience of, the, of using Windows if you required it to break off the browser. And that this wasn't, because this is what the whole case revolved around was the fact that the browser was tacked on, that it was automatically loaded in when you got the uh, Windows and therefore um, any other browser would have a very difficult time getting a foothold on the platform. And um, critically, a key defense for antitrust is that um, if you can show its damages, the overall function of the company or of a service, um, a product, then, uh, then perhaps the antitrust can be a case can be defeated. And so, the minute Facebook announced this to to many people, it was quite clear that this was they were trying to move faster than the EU or the US could bring antitrust um, uh, cases against them. So it'll be interesting to see what happens. It's just, but I, it, this goes back to my point that time is of the essence on a lot of these points where. Um, these companies know, you know, they ha they have armies of lawyers to try to slip through um, legislative approaches to curtail the way they operate. Thank you so much for that. Um, Anthony, did you want to speak? Yeah, maybe just a, a word on this, because when we proposed the Digital Markets Act uh, last December, or in the run up to it, there was a lot of debate about whether we should have a a, a, a breakup power or uh, in the jargon, uh, the power to impose structural remedies. Uh, and in the end, we, we proposed such a power as, as a last resort. So it's, it's, not a, it's not the first solution, but the last solution when, when all else uh, has failed. Uh, and there's a reason for that, uh, apart from the obvious political difficulties that, that Frank already referred to. Um, you, you need to know why you want to break up a company for, because uh, for very good reasons, most of the problem with the monopolies is in the monopoly. It, that problem can grow if you then extend the monopoly into other areas. Uh, and if you then start tying things together, which, which, which chills a, a neighboring competitive market and so on. But uh, splitting two relatively easily div divided divisions of a company will normally not solve the essential underlying problem of, of the monopoly, uh, but it may be something you, that you can address with the sort of behavioral rules that we have put uh, the focus on about avoid, avoiding tying, avoiding preferring your own neighboring services and, and, and so on. Um, but of course, if enforcement action uh, under such rules fails repeatedly, uh, if, if the problem really seems to be one of structural inability or unwillingness to, to respect the rules, well then of course you, you need to go to the extreme measures. Yes, thank you so much for that. And, um, oh, uh, Julian? Yeah, just to add in one thing, um, um, breaking up big tech 
is difficult, it's complex. The speakers have outlined that. Another option might happen is that people might walk away from it. Um, and again, going back to the blockchain, part of the reason why a lot of people in this space are angered by the idea of the sharing economy, the Facebook, we all know it now, it takes all our data and it monetizes it and doesn't pay us anything. And we have been conned into thinking that our data was not important and wasn't valuable. But there are many sites that are coming up in the blockchain world which offer payment in native uh, cryptocurrencies. So there's things like Steemit, Voice, um, a lot of diff different publications of, of sites where you actually go on board and you share your, your, your content. It's a social media sharing site. But rather, there's two things happen. Rather than the site itself monetizing your data, you get to share in, in the success of the site. And advertisers on many of these sites who come on board, they pay the, um, the, the viewer directly. So there isn't a, a, an intermediary, that middleman is gone. And because cryptocurrencies can be used to, to use uh, micro payments, you can pay someone a couple of cent or the equivalent of a couple of cent, which not be available in fiat. So we may not have to break them up. They may just sort of run out of steam because especially younger people, look at Facebook. Young people do not go on Facebook anymore. Um, are you on Facebook, Breed? I unfortunately am, and I have to remain so because um, I think I mentioned in my speech, I am a digital marketer. So ah, okay. uh, even though I complain about Facebook, I use Facebook every day for my job. <laughs> okay. But I think a lot of younger people are not just not using it. They're finding, finding other, other, you know, other things. So th th that is as, as, uh, another part of the equation. We might not have to break it up. People might move away. There's other Google, uh, sorry, browsing sites and search engines that are coming through that reward people again, rather than scalping people, it rewards people in, in native coins. So it'll be interesting to watch the space. I think that's a very good argument. And um, the idea of just, there will be natural competition that will emerge due to new technologies and innovation. And you see that partly with say the emergence of TikTok. Um, now admittedly TikTok is its own whole case and all, own political stuff with China and everything. But the innovation of the you know short form uh, videos has definitely overtaken say uh, the likes of um, Facebook. And I think um, um, Ian Ash in the comments uh, in the chat says that um, uh, Twitter took a correct stand in withdraw uh, withdrawing the Trump privilege. Uh, and I think what I really like is uh, while they are two separate uh, policy areas of, say, competition, antitrust, and content moderation, I actually think they're, they are linked by way of if there are more platforms out there that we can use with different moderating stances, um, they can certainly like tr Trump very much wanted to move to parlor after Twitter knocked him out. However, it was actually, I believe, Amazon and Google and a number of other web services that basically decided to stop providing parlor their, their cloud um, uh, requirements so they can no longer function. Um, and that is these tech giants serving as regulators of content moderation and also competition by way of, you know, they, Parler was a direct competition to uh, Twitter. Um, so I find it fascinating how, um, as much as I think it's important to keep those is the, the issues separate, they interact with each other quite clearly by way of, I think, you know, having separate platforms with varying degrees of content moderation by way of, you know, what is allowed and what isn't um, is something that's good. But when you only have, say, three platforms of Twitter, Facebook, and Google, it's hard to have the variety that, you know, I, a society would need. Um, but I was just wondering if anyone else had thoughts on that. Uh, Frank? Yeah, I just want to come back on that. Uh, the, the, another way around this is to make social media platforms like newspapers responsible for what they publish. Now, if you have a president like Trump who, who lies about just about everything um, and, Turns out that Facebook can be sued for something that Trump said that they published, then that changes the game somewhat. The reason I'm uneasy about Twitter, uh, and Ian doesn't agree with me, but Ian and I often have interesting arguments about things. Uh, the, 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 uh, the reason I'm uneasy is, is that private companies making arbitrary decisions, and that decision is by, by Jack Dorsey was somewhat arbitrary because so many people are lying on Twitter. So if you're going to do it for Donald Trump, you know, where do you stop? Uh, and, and, and that's a difficulty. I, I've long held the view that this idea 
that were only platforms, were not publishers and were not content generators, and therefore we have no responsibility, is a fundamental problem. Absolutely. If you could change that law, a lot of things would follow, I think, fairly quickly. Mm. Um, because these companies are very rich and they have deep pockets if you want to take a lawsuit, particularly in the United States. You're, you're, you're referring to Section 230, correct? By way of they don't have the liability of what someone would post on their website. That's right. So I, I can put any piece of slander. I could write something extremely rude about you, uh, libelous by you, put it up on Twitter uh, anonymously, right? Or let's say put it up on Facebook anonymously so you don't know who I am. You can't sue me. Right, but you do know it's on Facebook, but you can't sue Facebook. So what do you do to defend your good name? And I, I remember a very interesting exchange between uh, Alexandra Ocasio-Cortez and Mark Zuckerberg uh, when he came in front of her committee. And it was quite extraordinary, uh, going back to, I can't remember who said it earlier about uh, Carl Zuckerberg not being a competent leader. Uh, she was saying things, well, if I want to put up something on one of your sites, that says uh, something like, you know, this Republican people are in, are in favor of the green agenda, right? Which is not true, but I'm going to put that up on your site. I mean, how does that get moderated? And, and it was fascinating to see Zuckerberg seem to me just to be incapable of contemplating or understanding what the question was. You know, he was kind of, he said, I don't understand your question. And, and poor AOC was saying, but my question is a very simple one. Um, and, and if it were the case that if she were to do that, she, Facebook could be sued by the Republican politician uh, for slander or libel as it would be, then, then I think the situation would be changed. Um, whether that will happen, I don't know, but it would certainly be a step in the right direction. I, I certainly know that both Trump and Biden agree, um, made the, the argument that Section 230 should be repealed, which is one of the few policies that they agree on. Um, David, I think you had your, you want just to speak? A, just two questions to this very distinguished and really important panel. Um, the first is this, um, has blockchain technology uh, increased our chances of privacy on the web? Uh, that's my first question. My second question is, would anybody care to comment on the um, attempt by the government of Australia uh, to, uh, as, as it were, take dividends from the IT companies to support traditional media? Um, I'm sure that uh, Gillian would like to make a comment I'm on do the, the first Bitcoin. Bit. <laughs> yeah, the first bit. Um, actually, you know, it was interesting. I was going to say, uh, I didn't because I, I thought I was overrunning my time earlier about how the whole idea about how cryptocurrency is the dark web and, you know, you, you all do this stuff in secret. And ironically is that most cryptocurrency movements of, of, of money, of, of currency, is actually very visible. If you're on the Ethereum network, the blockchain, which is the second biggest blockchain, um, you, you can, if you, and if you know the person's wallet, so it's a long string of keys, or whatever. So it's anonymous, a pseudo-anonymous, I call it. But you can actually track them. So if you have somebody's wallet address, you can go on to EtherScan and see what they've spent their money on, which is not, you know, private at all. Um, and now, I mean, I'm actually working for a company that's trying to bring a layer of privacy. So people do their compliance before they get onto a chain. And then when they're on chain, no more than I can't look at your bank account. You know, I'm not allowed to do that. But on, on the, so, so the, the actual transfer and also actually within 2016 elections, those Russian spies, I think when they, when they caught it with, because they were tampering with the elections, they were also done for money laundering because they use Bitcoin to pay off the servers, you know? So it's like, it's kind of a crazy, it's quite transparent. But in terms of, of your, your privacy, it allows people to, privacy is a huge thing in the cryptocurrency world. And most of it is directed at governments and at banks and financial institutions and, and the control of the censorship control, because a lot of the platforms where people talk, they, are, they would prove themselves to be censorship resistance. And the idea is that you can't just take somebody off. Now, conversely, what will happen too as well is that in a lot of these communities, and community is huge in this space, people talk about the corporate, the, sorry, the, the governance of a, of a blockchain or of a platform where people who have stake, who've got, uh, who have whole token, can actually vote on what's happening, what's right and what's wrong and what the behaviours are. So it's a little, little bit of both. I think it does give freedom back to people because you, you can't, uh, for example, I just thought very quickly with, with financial stuff. We saw how was it, uh, you know, the haircuts that people got because their deposits were over a hundred thousand, or banks to quantitative easing, all this type of stuff. But if you own your own money 
on a blockchain, you own it and you can transfer it. So that gives you privacy and control over what you do. I think, am I answering your question? Well, I guess uh, I'm, I, I'm muddy the water, I think, actually. <laughs> <laughs> it just seemed to me that one of the uh, things that were touted in relation to blockchain was that it had the capacity to create uh, entirely secure uh, uh, stores of information, if you like, uh, that could not be hacked. Well, they can't be hacked, but they could be seen. I think that's maybe the difference is that, and that's the whole point about if, you know, those, those Facebook hacks, because they're centralized databases. But if you have, if you commit data to the blockchain, then in, in a public blockchain, then it will always be visible. Uh, yes, but can you, uh, can, uh, uh, if you like, um, uh, can databases be created uh, uh, which use blockchain technology, which cannot be uh, uh, hacked, uh, so that they remain completely and utterly secure. Yes, well, the the decentralized nation. I mean, fifty one percent is what they call your your denial of service and your hacking. So you have to have a certain amount, uh, and that would take a lot of a lot of uh, power and um, and people to do that. But you you can it it would be secure if it's if it's a private blockchain, no one can see it. Okay. Public one, people can see. If I could just say that my reason for being interested in this is as a geneticist. So uh, one of the most remarkable pieces of data that we can acquire, of course, is our complete genome sequence. Yeah. So I can have my g- genome sequenced. Uh, the only way it can possibly be uh, recorded is on a computerized database. Can it be put on a database in such a way that the only person who has access to it is me? And that goes back to the general concept of data being personal, private and owned, including all the stuff that is collected, by the way, uh, by Facebook or Google or anybody else, which I think Carlin was talking about, the, the concept that our own, the data that we have, our own personal data must be owned and completely controlled by us unless, for altruistic reasons, uh, for example, we want to share it. I could answer it in two ways. First off, yes, um, there's a GDPR compliant blockchain called Europe Chain run by an, in the EOS blockchain. And they address this exact issue where they use the hash, which is like a, like a snapshot, but not of the data. So the data is hidden, it's accessible, but only by people who have access to that. So yes, you can. But interestingly, you know your DNA stuff, you know, you know this, that all the big um, 23 and, and me and, and uh, Ancestry, they, people go off and they, they, they want to get their DNA done because they want to know where they come from, whatever. Yeah. And they, they, they're, these are all loss leaders. And then they're asked at the end, will you, will you allow us to use your data for scientific research? 80% of people say yes. What actually happens is that those companies, this is well documented, then go and sell all that data in multiple millions of, of dollars of value. And the person who actually donated it gets no value. And, and, and it's, this is not as if they donated it in order to be like a philanthropic donator of their data because they've got a rare disease that they want to share with the world. And there are a number of blockchain uh, projects that look to address that. Some of them to actually hide it and to and not allow that sharing. And other ones to say, if you want to share it, you will be monetized correctly for it. So yes, is, is the answer to your question. Uh, and the second part. Frank is going to deal with that. Maybe. Well, yeah, I, I think so. I'm not an expert on blockchain. I would think, in principle, the answer to your question is yes, David, it can be done, as I understand blockchain. But one um, elephant in the room that hasn't been mentioned at all tonight, and Owen O'Dell, believe it or not, um, uh, former uh, chairman of Fellows and lawyer in Trinity, did some work on this, is de-anonymization. There's a kind of assumption out there that a lot of the stuff that, that, that these companies have is anonymous. Um, but th- th- there was a, a study done, uh, I can't remember the exact figures, Owen showed it to me, whereby people tried to identify who exactly people were and link them with their social security numbers in the United States. And they got about 87% of them right. Um, because there's so much information out there that it becomes, a, you know, what might look superficially anonymous actually can be pinned down. Sure. Uh, and and, and it, it's... Uh, Many years ago, I looked at Google. I went. I, I had a, a spare afternoon in the office, and I spent some time trying to find out what Google thought I was. And I, I discovered that I thought I was a, because it kept sending me adverts for face cream. Um, <laughs> <laughs> 
<laughs> and I found out that it thought I was a, a 55 year old woman with a PhD. <laughs> uh, they say two out of three isn't bad. One out of three is not really very good. Uh, <laughs> and uh, um, and uh, but but I, I do one of the things that concerns me, and it goes back to something Carlin said earlier, is this lack of a Chinese wall, for want of a better expression, between the state and the uh, these private surveillance companies. And I think that there there are probably things going on behind the scenes that we're not aware of. I don't want to be paranoid about this because I really don't want to get into the mode of conspiracy theory. But certainly I would be very worried about what was going on with authoritarian states. And for example, uh, I, one of my children uh, travel, used to travel in China a lot. And he said, you can't do business. You can't move around in China in parts of it these days because nobody uses cash. And the only thing you can use is their equivalent of something like Apple Pay. And, and therefore, uh, if you want to buy something, you said, you've got to give uh, cash to a local who can buy it for you and who can later change that cash into something else. But what this means is that in, in China, every transaction can be traced. And I want to come back to a point here that was a bit outside this debate, but I was tempted to make tonight. I've always said one of the big problems with the surveillance state, going back to that, uh, uh, is that there are far more of us than there are of them. Uh, so uh, states like East Germany, if you saw the lives of others, I mean, a vast portion of the population was spying on the rest. But when you get into modern artificial intelligence systems, actually, that's not required anymore. So an AI system can track somebody with face recognition as they move around the street. It doesn't require a guy or a girl sitting at a monitor to do this. OK, it's not like spooks way back, if you remember the TV series where they used to do this by hand, as it were, or by eye. Now the machines can do it. And that's a scary prospect because that increases the risks of spying, of control, of manipulation, uh, of, of taking advantage of people. And, and that is another thing that we need to think about when we think about all of this big tech and where it's going. Sorry to keep you awake for late at night, David, but... <laughs> <laughs> My goodness me. Yeah, Blonnet, I think, is going to... Yeah. Just going to add two things. I, I think one, you know, when we look at some of these um, uh, data steals as such, uh, and then you you look to see what's actually happened, and people have given freely of their information. And part of the problem, I think, as a contract lawyer, is that you're trying to do something online, whether it's buy something in Amazon or uh, read read the Guardian or whatever it might be. And something pops up and you're asked, tick this, you know, do you agree to these cookies? Do you agree to give this? You know, will you look at the security precaution? And you're trying to get somewhere, so you tick it. And I think because of the changes that have in, been introduced, we're in a sense, we're almost less safe in that we have freely voluntarily given information because we are careless with it. Uh, we are asked to do it and, and we do do it. So that was the first point. And then the second point was really just a, a question for, for Gillian, which is in that when you look at companies like Bitcoin and then you look at the um, central banks and now the idea of central banks getting involved in cryptocurrency and there is very sort of strong um, signals coming from um, this and, and coming from, uh, from the Federal Reserve in the US um, that this is something that central banks will do partly, perhaps, and it's, it's very much in the future, but partly because they can be trusted in a way that unknown uh, entities like Bitcoin can't. So I was going to ask Ooh, you about very that. Very interesting. First of all, Bitcoin is not a company. It's well, not an, an entity. Yeah. Uh, uh, and it's not uh, controlled uh, by anybody. And that's, so, that's the problem. That's, and that's why they're saying oh, but see, that's people not the want problem. this. Ah, uh, you see, this is the, the nub of it, because we've been brought up in a society where we think that we need a trusted intermediary to exchange value. And because, I, you know, if I hand you a pen, you're going to say, is that worth the same as my, you know, mic or whatever it is? And we use banks as trusted intermediaries for financial terms, and um, they haven't served us very well. We've seen that in the crash. We see it how, you know, tracker mortgages. We see all these things that banks tend not to serve people terribly well. Um, and even then governments, governments issue money, it's centrally issued, so they can do the, the quantitative easing and all the stuff that, that goes on. How can you go, does this actually make sense? So with the Bitcoin, what's really interesting about the Bitcoin is the thing that you think is troublesome is actually its inherent value. It's a trustless, 
trustless. You don't need to trust anybody. It's based on a mathematical uh, algorithm. There will only ever be 21 million of these coins issued. Um, and you, you, I, can't, I cannot like do more quantitative easing. I can't create more Bitcoin. There will never be any more Bitcoin than exists. So this, this actually, this thing that sounds kind of counterintuitive when you first hear about it, oh, I, how do I trust it? You don't have to, there's nobody there to trust. It, it is what it is. And actually you're saying that governments bring in um, the CBDC, the, the central bank's digital currencies. Very interesting. Now they're not cryptocurrencies because they are controlled, they're centralized. Yes. But what governments are looking at doing is part of the reason why cryptocurrencies are so interesting is that they're fast to send, they're cheap to send, and they're, they're they, they trustworthy. You don't get, they don't get lost in the middle. Once it's sent, it's gone, leaves, leaves your wallet, goes another one. So it's, yes, they're taking many of the attributes and the features of using cryptocurrency, which are simple, but CBDCs are not cryptocurrencies in its, in its uh, sense. It's a central bank and it's centralized. So it's not decentralized. So one of the core uh, features of cryptocurrencies is that they are decentralized. So it's very interesting, but the, 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 the null of it is that Bitcoin, you don't need to trust Bitcoin because there is nothing to trust. It's just, it's there, it exists, it's maths. Can, I ask, you, can I ask you, Gillian, please, to write an article for the Irish Times, uh, preferably, um, explaining to all of us what you've just said now so we can have it easily there to look at and say, yes, this is Bitcoin. Oh, I would love to. I mean, I write all the time in, in and actually I have to hand up. I have, I'm not a regular writer for the Irish Times. I thought, oh, and then I didn't realize Carl was going to be, oh, so do, but ignore that. But I, I write frequently. I'm a, I am co-founded my own news site and I write frequently for uh, blockchain publications. So that's why I'm, I'm in this space. Uh, but I would love to because I, I believe when I discovered blockchain four years ago, I went, ah, that's how I can change the world. And if I may be very brief to take your time, the dot-com that was mentioned, I think Frank mentioned earlier, the dot-com, oh no, you did, sorry, I beg your pardon, you mentioned it when the, the Irish Times was hit. The dot-com was interesting though, because it was a lot of innovation. And um, people like said, oh, I'll never buy a book on the internet. I'll never buy clothes on the internet. So a lot of innovation. And it was also a lot of uh, unthinking things. So it was innovation and rethinking the world, which was fantastic. And I love being part of it, but that was kind of it. Now in this blockchain world that I adore passionately, as you can tell, there's a third element. So it's innovation, it's unthinking the world, but there's a huge ethos behind people are working in these spaces and they genuine, genuinely want to make the world a better place. And that really excites me because some of the product, the one I mentioned about the DNA stuff, it's to protect people. Why should 23andMe or Answers make all that money? Whereas you might be able to make money off your, you know, there, there's a certain fairness in that. And there are so many projects in this space that people, Alex Mashinsky, I mentioned earlier on, the serial American entrepreneur who invented voice over IP, his Celsius, he said, you know, banks could give you interest. They could treat you right. They, they choose not to. And he, he's got almost a billion, I think, now under management with his Celsius uh, uh, cryptocurrency, with his bank base that he has. So it's, yes, let me write, because I, I believe, I mean, I, I often laugh because often people think about cryptocurrency, got nerds and all very, you know, all very exciting things. And I'm going, I'm a middle-aged, middle-class lady. There is nothing scary about me. You know, I don't even listen to Dolly Parton. I'm not even scary in my music choices. <laughs> and, and that's where I'm kind of going, if I can see the, ver that's, so yes, yes is the answer to your question. I would love to. I think it's my mission in life is to tell people about it. Frank, That's absolutely go there. fantastic. Uh, Frank? Uh, I, I just um, wanted to say something to, to Blonnet and maybe to the wider audience. Um, quite a lot of browsers, uh, or not quite a lot, but some browsers, particularly Firefox, I think, and certainly Brave, have what are called private browsing windows. So if you open a website and that, no matter what cookies you clip, okay, they will be deleted at the end of the session. Uh, and I would if you're not familiar with the Brave browser, I'd certainly have a look at it. It's the one that I think is the most secure and safe and independent of the browsers that's out there at the moment. I use it for everything now, except for uh, one or two things that I use Firefox for. Um, it's my default browser. So private windows are really useful. I do find it absolutely fascinating um, how I, I, I'm not sure cyber literacy, I guess, is something that's like now being taught in uh, schools. My 10 year old niece um, had a Zoom lecture about this uh, like a month ago. And um, it was fascinating because they covered stuff like this, um, stuff about how, you know, you can be tracked on the 
internet and you should always be careful about you know where like just remember where you put your you know details in and stuff like that uh, and again she's only 10 and I think it's something that everyone in our society should be learning up about say you know when you like say deleting your search history or deleting the cookies that are um, on your machine uh, and just knowing like smart ways like keeping keeping track of your passwords and not just using the same password over and over again. <laughs> um, I wanted to just um, ask um, or actually go back to, I believe David um, asked two questions and the second question was just on the Australian, um, the Australian attempt to basically um, have uh, the the big tech pay for journalism, um, which I find to be a really interesting example because on the surface it seems like oh that's a very good solution and fair, um, but what's really interesting is that it's largely broken down. It's 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 largely being supported by what essentially are the Murdochs of the world, the actual massive press companies out there, the broadcasters, um, who are just looking for a shakedown. Um, I think uh, Casey Newton, yeah. who, um, ha, uh, who covers um, a huge amount of tech policy in America, described it as literally a shakedown of these big uh, media corporations just looking for a payment from these big tech corporations. Um, so again, while I'm quite happy that there's action being taken, I think you should always, like, I think they're, they're, it doesn't necessarily solve the problem of, say, a smaller publisher who um, can't make a living off of what they're doing. Um, but, you know, the Murdochs of the world can get millions out of Facebook and Google. May I just, uh, th th that actually is a very, very big concern for mine, of mine. That I, I, I mentioned sort of mainstream media at one stage and I talked about the red tops and the gutter press. I don't see any reason at all why they should be supported, frankly. The problem is to decide what's the gutter press and what isn't, and who's going to decide. I think the way to do it is possibly to imagine that uh, uh, the big tech companies, the, the Googles and so on, that they will be taxed in some way, and that money will go into some kind of fund, um, which will have some rubrics, some uh, uh, rules about what it can support, and that the, there will be um, principles established by which it is uh, able to support certain kinds of, uh, of um, press and media activities, but not others. In other words, thinking of the public interest in the, uh, at, at the peak of this. Incredibly difficult. I mean, we have a commission meeting on, the, on this matter in Ireland at the moment, I think, but uh, I'm not sure, sure how far it has got. But it's a big problem. I do agree with you, Reid. Any, Anthony? Could I jump in on that, uh, yes. Madam Auditor? If we, even if in, in this more informal bit, I address you by your, your title, Breed. Um, uh, maybe something on the, the link between traditional media and the, the broader debate on, on data that, that uh, you launched in, in, in your address. Uh, of course, we, we think of the whole question of profiling and collection of data on people in order to serve them advertising as something which is very much driven and dominated by a few big tech platforms. And that is the case. Uh, but precisely because the, uh, the livelihoods of the traditional media have been shrinking as advertising moves to, to various online platforms, they have become themselves extremely vocal and attached to behavioral advertising themselves. So on the still pretty vibrant questions about cookies, e-privacy and, and, and so on, uh, you actually find the media and uh, the, the advertising uh, based platforms uh, on the same side of the debate. That doesn't mean it's the right or the wrong side, but it just means that there are no easy, easy divisions on this. The second thing I would mention is that there may be more than one way to, to skin this particular cat of assuring some line of revenues to, uh, to what I would call uh, editorially responsible media, different from platforms which are covered by some sort of, of purely user generated yeah. content model. Um, we had a lot of debate in 
during the Juncker Commission were accused of all sorts of terrible things like imposing link taxes uh, because we, with great difficulty, ultimately created a, a specific sort of quasi-copyright for uh, newspapers uh, or similar media uh, to get value when small excerpts of, uh, of, of, of stories uh, were reproduced by, by platforms. Now, uh, that's just coming into force. The, the French moved early on it and are already in a, a sort of a combined application of antitrust law and of these new rules in order to bring Google to the table with the French press. Uh, so uh, copyright rules may be one way of addressing it. The Australian path which is to do an, an adaptation of their, of their competition rules to impose compulsory mediation is, is another way. Uh, we don't necessarily need both, uh, but it's perhaps no surprise that various media representative organizations are of course pressing us to include precisely that sort of, of Australian solution uh, on top of the one that I, I just described in, in copyright in the Digital Markets Act. Um, we weighed that up and thought it was a little bit too soon before one solution had really proved itself before we would add another to, to a fresh legislative proposal. But there is certainly a, a pretty live uh, political debate coming on that. Uh, there's no doubt of it. And if, if I may abuse the mic to go back to an earlier discussion on liability. I think this is connected because, of course, one of the main differences between an editorially responsible media organ and, and a platform is precisely that the editor of the Irish Times is responsible for everything that appears in, it, in, its, pa in its pages. Um, the US reference is sometimes a bit unhelpful because Article 230 is a very crude instrument. It actually basically says no liability for user uploaded content. We have in Europe actually somewhat more sophisticated rules, which we are trying to, to further improve with the Digital Services Act, because while a platform is not responsible for immediately for all that its billions perhaps of users put there, and in a way, how could it be? Once it is put on notice, uh, that content may be illegal. Illegal because it, it's promoting terrorism or because it's defamatory and there are all sorts of reasons. Uh, then it has a responsibility to look into it and may be liable for it if it doesn't do so. And, and that seems to me to be a, a better middle ground than simply a, a, a free pass um, because the, completely introducing editorial liability for user-generated content could have enormous chilling effects because of the profit motive of, of, of platforms. If anything that is vaguely potentially defamatory uh, uh, is sufficient for them to be liable for what could be significant damages, then the, the obvious solution for them is to moderate extremely aggressively uh, and then platforms as a, as a space for sometimes distasteful uh, and, and, and abusive, but often very liberating speech would be, would be massively constrained, which is perhaps not what we want. Yeah. Yes, I 100% agree with you on the um, idea that the, um, the uh, Section 230 is a very blunt instrument. Again, I think it's 26 words long. Um, so. <laughs> It's not very um, detailed. And um, I also would like to just say as a, a, a short note of, uh, I feel almost um, ashamed to be far more connected to the US laws than European laws um, for no particular reason bar the fact that I think I just consume a lot of US media. You might even hear a US um, American uh, accent or twang off of my voice, uh, which has no actual basis in terms of I've only been to America once. Um, but my family have christened me as, uh, uh, I think it's an East Yank. Uh, 
<laughs> which is um but i am incredibly proud of the uh um the regulations and the details that uh, the european union have enforced and especially compared to the us it's far more impressive and well thought out uh frank i i believe you had your you want to speak I was just uh, dwelling on all of this discussion i'm gonna i'm really gonna show my age here now but i i i brought back to uh i think it's a johnny mitchell song uh, big yellow taxi um which has a line in it that says don't it always seem to go that you don't know what you've got till it's gone and and i, I think this is something that that needs to be remembered uh, it's great to water from amazon it's wonderful but if that means the demise of your local hardware store that's not so good uh, i was in southampton many years ago but i think uh, so i could work it out as my 35th wedding anniversary uh, and 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 uh, it, we went down the high street of Southampton, and it was nothing but banks and charity shops. This was the main street of the town, running down to the water. And the reason for this was that the entire life had been sucked out of the city centre by a massive shopping centre. The shopping malls sucked the life out of the centre of towns, and it was known as the Walmart effect. In fact, there was a book written called the Walmart effect, which we used to debate in MSIS classes, incidentally. Um, uh, and now the modern equivalent of the Walmart effect is big tech. It is sucking life out of newspapers. It's sucking life out of small shops. And this, I don't think, is something that comes down to legislation. This comes down to individual behavior. Mm -hmm. And the risk here is what's known by economists as the tragedy of the commons. Mm -hmm. You know, that nobody thinks it's down to them. So it doesn't matter what I do. But if everybody starts thinking that way, sooner or later, we wake up and they've paved paradise and put up a parking lot. That's an excellent point. And I think the point on the individual, which I partially went over very quickly in my speech, but I can understand if people thought I disregarded, it, um, is crucially important in terms of educating yourself and, and, and actually ev evaluating your decisions. There's a question actually in the chat uh, from Ellis. So, so much of privacy infringements happen outside, i.e. we don't know what sort of infirmments uh, uh, sur uh, sur uh, surveillance capitalism may make about us uh, from information about us. Most users aren't sophisticated enough to know whether a Facebook pix pix pixel is firing on a website we visit. How do we confront something out of sight? So I was just wondering if any, and I, I, I'll take this as our, probably our last question, just because I realize it's getting quite late. So is there any panelists who'd like to respond to that? I hoped, I, I hoped Colin would put up our hand. <laughs> I was, I was keeping an eye on that comment, actually, because I was going to um, try to come in and, and, and steer it back to, to answering that anyway, uh, because it, um, at the point when we were discussing Owen O'Dell noting the lack of anonymity, even when we think we have anonymity in our data, um, I, I had wanted to make that point that I have yet to find anyone who really um, is an expert on, on data protection and data privacy who would agree with any of the claims by any company that your data is anonymized before it's handed over for any kind of research, for example. It's one of the reasons why I think it's, it's critically important to be looking at um, national genomes as a, as a um, national resource that should be protected and not put up for, for sale for research. And that connects back to the 23andMe point. I mean, much of this data tends to be, you know, they'll say it's anonymized or that it's when it's actually pseudonymized, which means eventually you can, you can piece things back together, which has implications for um, genetic data and, and, uh, and who can see it and where it ends up and what connections might be made and how um, transparent are companies handling that data and um, how secure, when all they do is have to make a statement that it's all very secure, but we don't know that it's all very secure because it's not an open database, for example, and that can be ranging from 23andMe to, to companies anywhere taking in data and, and processing it. And so it comes back to this point of how do we confront something out of sight? And I think maybe that's, that's um, something, uh, you know, for th that um, an EU expert to answer some of those and maybe in legislative terms. But I think 
obviously, if you have greater transparency in algorithms and you require that, you begin and you have uh, greater obligations on companies to conform to um, to specific regulations and specific re specific requirements on transparency, then you begin to have the tools to rein this in before it begins to get out of control. And going back again to Shoshana Zuboff's research on this, I mean, her book is just eye-opening on how what we now call surveillance capitalism gradually came to be established because there was just this mass data grab by companies that realized they could do things that were often on the edge of legality or even illegal in taking data, but there was nobody there to prevent it or they figured they would just kind of overcome it or buy off the problem or whatever at some future point. So it is a huge, huge issue. How do we how do we confront something out of sight? Um, I think that's one of the main challenges that we will have in trying to grapple with this much broader issue. And part of it is making people realize um, how important these issues that are very hidden are and that they do affect affect them with it with all due respect to to the esteemed president i would say you might not notice that any that any of your data is being used and taken but actually every time you're online all your data is being used and taken and you can be analyzed and parsed and classified and databases sold on in all sorts of um quite appalling ways and that we don't um and and you're auctioned in tiny mini auctions on in, yeah. in massive advertising um, ad tech networks. Every time you're online in that split second, there's an auction of you to receive a particular ad in that split second before when at the point when you click on a web page and as it begins to assemble and suddenly the ad comes up for the shoes you had looked at on some website three days earlier. And the reason it's there is because your data was just put up to auction in a um, totally automated instantaneous auction and you were sold to whoever wanted to show you the shoe ad. So a lot of this happens very surreptitiously. We don't know about it. And I really welcome these um, ideas coming out of the EU to deal with this because I really feel the EU has led on so many of these um, of these issues, speaking as an American who goes back and forth between back in the day when you could go back and forth but, um, and sat in on many of these discussions at big conferences and professional events on data, there's just a complete, there was a complete lack of awareness on the ways in which the EU is moving forward on these things. One of the greatest pleasures I've had in my entire writing career in 30 years was attending the RSA Data Security Conference, the single biggest event at the point when about just weeks before GDPR was going to come into effect and literally no one had been paying attention. I mean, hardly, there were lawyers there who were saying things that just simply weren't true. There were people there and the, there were companies there in a state of shock that this was actually going to happen and that they really just had not thought the EU would ever do something with some teeth on the data issue and when the EU did, um, oh boy, did I enjoy that moment of them all being in shock. But anyway, um, yeah, that's, that's I, I, I hope this, uh, you know, this whole event has enabled people to think perhaps more clearly um, about many of these things, or at least to want to question um, what we're told by companies um, about what they're doing with our data and what they're actually taking and how they're using it. <laughs> yeah, thank you. you, completely agree. Um, David? Uh, I just uh, wanted to say a very small number of words in closing. First of all, I think, Breed, you have uh, broken another record. This is the longest inaugural in the history of the society. <laughs> and uh, if we had only been at the previous 250, uh, we might well, I think, be justified in saying it's been one of the most enjoyable, and dare I say it, one of the most important. And I'm not I just, I wonder, five extraordinary speakers, uh, some of whom I'm sure knew each other before, but perhaps not to the extent that they've learned about each other tonight. And I just hope that, uh, that they continue to talk with each other and learn from each other, because I think each of them has had something very special to say. 
the, the second last thing I'd like to say is, Breed, immense congratulations to you. You've uh, done something quite, well, It never in the past and not to be repeated, I would say. So thank you very much. And the last thing I'd like to, to refer to is the word moderator. Some of you know that when you graduate from Trinity with an honors degree, you graduate with a moderatorship. And most students who graduate with a moderatorship have absolutely no idea why their degree is qualified by the term moderator. And the answer is very much related to the discussions we've had tonight. It, it is a sign to the student who is just graduating that the university believes that they're capable of moderating an argument. That's the precise meaning of it, that you, when you graduate breed, all the fellow students in the, in the HIST, when you get an honours degree, you, we believe, that is the university believes, you are, you've learned enough, you've had enough experience, you have enough independence of mind to moderate an argument. And of course, that's what we're talking about when we're asking people to moderate what is actually being put onto uh, websites and so forth. And uh, I'm, I'm saying it's not exactly the same thing, but the origin of the term is exactly the same, that you are, we are seeking fairness, uh, integrity, decency, um, a sense of uh, especially public responsibility. So that's my last word, but uh, breed three hours of Absolutely splendid, uh, splendid, splendid uh, discussion. Thank you. I, I've been absolutely honored to um, organize and have this meeting uh, this this evening. Um, it's been amazing to listen to everyone here. Thank you so much to all our speakers, to McConnell. I'm so grateful and. Um, I, I recognize that I've had you here for three hours, which is far past the time I said this would be over, but it's been so excellent. And I do hope you had a wonderful time and thank you to all the attendees. I hope you learned something and you go out and learn some more because I think this is a fascinating issue that will um, continue being relevant into many years to come. Uh, so again, thank you so much for this evening and have a lovely, lovely week to everyone here. And uh, yeah, I will end this webinar, but again, thank you. And it's been my absolute honor to uh, address the society this evening. Good night. <laughs>